segment. Or oh, segment really? Because the, the laptop itself doesn't, it can't keep up. It's too bogged down with shit. And so it's, it doesn't have as much frequency coming into the USB ports as my old one does. But this one, for some reason, it's newer. But it has like just a lot of stuff on it. So it's having a tough time buffering everything, especially when the three of us are doing it. Right. There's so much going on. Yeah, but I lucked out last time when uh, Anthony and I did ours, which was last week's. Yeah, last week's. And it was good the whole time. So, I just, but I just kept check periodically because if it stops, then we have to stop, and then I got right, used right. to it or whatever. But. Hello, everyone. This is G from the F Word here to do another deep dive episode with my high school buddy Robert. Hello, guys. Robert, what's going on, man? Not much. What's going on with you, G? Nothing, man. Uh, Robert is, as I mentioned, a high school friend. He also mentioned that he listened to the show. I read your uh, response, where your, your message to me, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where you thought it was like kind of weird that you were saying, hey, I listened to your thing or whatever. And I was like, I forget if you had said, it'd be cool if I can get on there, or if I said, you should come on. Oh, I 100% invited myself. Did Not you? a question, okay, cool. yes. <laughs> well, that's good. And then I was like, oh, we should totally do it. But I know you wanted to do something with Anthony and Vass, like kind of like the, the Yeah, I just want to take over the show. But I'm going to be the fourth host pretty soon. Yeah, but then what happened was when I looked at what you were wanting to talk about and the knowledge that Anthony and Vass have on those, specifically like hip-hop and all that stuff, it's like, I don't know if we'd be able to carry a conversation that much. No, I mean, I just I just want to be in the mix. I was seeing oh, you yeah. guys, the dynamic you guys have, I just wanted to see, be a part of that. That was all I was talking well, about. Well, and you still can. Yeah. But what we're going to do now is test drive a deep dive to get you comfortable on the mic. See who I am on this thing. Yeah, yep. man. Sometimes you got to start off as a hype man, and then you can get it into the lead. Yeah, like Flavor Flav. Exactly. He's the most famous one. Has to be. I can't think of anybody else. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're going to be doing a deep dive on I have not, I'm not sure yet. But no, we're gonna whatever. Roll we're going to dive and then see where we go from yeah. there. First of all, I haven't seen you in a while. Right. And so this is just going to be a nice little cool catch up thing. Yeah. And our listeners could kind of be like, hey, who are some of Jeeves friends and who has he kept up with? Well, it's me, your main keeping up friend. Yeah, exactly. So what's new? We're having a baby. You're having a baby? Having a super baby. Holy shit. Yeah. When? Uh, next month. Well, Get uh, out. No, two months. November, first week of November. Oh, that's a good that's a good one. Yeah. Uh both Nick is yeah. a November first baby and my buddy Mac is a November first baby. Because I'm a November third baby, so it's gonna Ooh. be right in that wheelhouse. That's a good one. The only shitty thing is is that your birthday is now on the sidelines if it's in that week, right? Believe me, I know. <laughs> I'm not gonna get a present ever again. Yeah, it's true. Um just some quick housekeeping stuff. Of course you all know that the uh this is the F word is part of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network, which is sponsored by Connexus Credit Union. Head over to ConnexusMoneyTalk.ca or go hashtag Money Talk and take care of all your money needs by talking about it. Yeah, that'll work. So do that if you're so inclined. So you getting nervous for the baby? Uh, I don't know about nervous. Just having. The labor's going to be one thing, because that's spooky for everyone. Just like it's, something goes wrong, it's painful. You don't mm. want to see your partner struggle like that. For sure. But also it just, everything changes. Mm-hmm. Like the whole, your whole life, the movies that you watch, anything, you, you're not doing that anymore. You're going to be all up in that Peppa Pig. Mm-hmm. Be. I'm just and, trying and, to uh, shuffle out kids shows now. Yeah. Have you already started? Have you already tried to like well, brainwash yourself to like them? Mm, no, not yet. No. I'm trying to just weed it out, see what's out there, but... It's going to be a while before any actual TVs watch. It's just going to be colors at this point. Yeah, colors and shapes. Yeah. That's cool. Fun noises. Have you guys figured out if you're having a boy or girl or are you going to wait? It's a boy. We had oh. a reveal party. Um, yeah, we were pretty sure it was going to be a girl. And then about a week before the reveal, we're like, we just had this gut feeling it was going to be a boy. Popped the balloon and it was blue. So oh, crazy. we knew it. It's really funny because we opened this up by saying how we've kept up since high school and I had no idea you were having a baby. But I did know <laughs> that you were married. And you guys are, what, three years? Two years. Two, Two years, years now? Of September, yeah. yeah. Uh, also, some backstory. I was helping you guys look for a house at the time. Mm-hmm. And then I left. And then you guys decided, we're not going to get one yet. Did you guys end up getting one? We did. Congrats. We got one in May. Nice. Um, Whitmore Park. Nice. Uh, yeah, it was. it's crazy from when the time you and I looked. 
just how the market changed so much. Like houses that we were looking at with you yeah. are like 100 grand less, 60 grand less. It's pretty awesome. And man. it's crazy. So yeah. like it was stuff that wasn't even in our budget before was we could afford it and then some. So it was pretty nice. It's a timing thing, right? Yeah, that's a lot of the times. And that worked out way better because I remember that one house. We were, going, we we're almost on oh, the verge. God. I still have nightmares about that house. That a, was. I'm glad it didn't go through. <laughs> we I'm think so, our lucky stars. I'm yeah. so glad we slept on that because we would have been. I don't. Know, I don't even know what we liked about it. Well, and I felt so bad because I was like, just sleep on it and wait for a bit. And then at the same time, I was worried that if this was actually going to be your forever house, <laughs> that you guys would be so mad. <laughs> and so, like the next day, it was just like both of you. Nope. I was like. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. And it's tough because you're in a position where you can't tell us, hey, don't do not do it. You can't just straight up be don't do it because it's yeah. not your decision. But you also don't want us to jump into this dive of a place. Well, especially because like it'd be it's much harder after we get the first like, first of all, you have to put in your deposit. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, you'd have to pay for your inspection, which is like 400 and some bucks only to find what's wrong with it because yeah. we can only see what we can at a glance. Right. But uh, no, that worked out. And the house is going good. Everything's good with you guys. Yeah, house. being a homeowner is weird as hell. Yeah. Well, did you find it like, I don't know, I'm scared to like do anything ever. Well, see, I'm different because I ended up buying a rental property. Right. Soph had already bought the condo before we got married. So living in the condo is a little bit different than actually getting a full-blown house. With my rental property, though, the time I bought it, everything was going haywire. It was both good and bad, but things got haywire after. And then so I was so scared to even look at that building. I think for seven months, I didn't even go near the street because I was terrified. So I can kind of understand how you'd be scared to actually do stuff to it. Yeah, it's like when I was in a rental property, you screw up a wall. Cool. Landlord yeah. can deal with it. Now, like you put the nail in the wrong spot or you mount the TV wrong. Like mm. you got to figure out how to fix that now. And, and all the holes that come with. Yeah, exactly. In the wrong so spot. I've been either stuff that's simple. I overthink too much now. I did put up a TV in our bedroom. And it's, it is crooked by a hair. And it drives you nuts. Every It's all you can see. Time. Well, the only time I can actually look at that TV is when it's pitch dark because all you see is the screen. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, that first night, I just know it looked like I had put it completely horizontal. Yeah. I was no. like, all right. I set, up, I set up mine the first time in the bedroom and I did a terrible job. And my wife's like, oh, no, it looks fine. I'm like, no, it doesn't. I reset it again. And it's off by the little bit. And like, we'll be watching a TV show and for the whole hour. I'm just like, no, it's not right. But there's. That's not worth taking down. Well, and, and the second it happened, I'm just like, this is as good as it's going to get mm -hmm. anymore, and it's going to go haywire. Yeah, you're going to make it so much worse. Well, and uh, what's funny with our building, the there was a lady that was in charge of kind of decorating and stuff, and they had put up a mirror in the main hall, like the vestibule when you walk in, mm -hmm. and the mirror had fallen down. And so if you're superstitious, it's not very good. Right. And Soph's a little superstitious. But anyways, we were under the impression for like a year and a half that the walls were so thin that you can't put anything up and it turned I'm, I'm like that doesn't seem right for the longest time but I, it's just it was so's place i was like hey that's cool do your but that's fine we'll wait and uh well it turns out after that the guys that installed it some of the contractors which kind of kind of adds up to the fact that our building is garbage didn't put it didn't even check for the studs they just put it up right <laughs> it just collapsed down i was like okay sweet so now we have stuff on our walls before it was just like these blank just... walls couldn't even put shelving up silly 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 and you like whitmore park it's cool being back it's there. so nice like it's yeah. so quiet the neighbors are too damn friendly nice like i too I much not too much but i'm an, i like to keep to myself and they're always saying hi and waving and being polite, and I don't know how to. How do you like? I don't know. I'm not a small talk guy, mm. so oh yeah, no, you know the grass. I don't want to talk about my grass with a stranger. Like it's yeah, and it's so weird, and they're so nice, and people are always offering to help. And this our one neighbor, we have underground sprinklers, and took us till like last week for me to figure out how they worked. <laughs> and so she came over and she gave us her little like portable sprinklers for us to water our lawn and stuff, and. How do you repay someone for that? Like, how do you thank them? Like, just the generosity. It's, it's obviously it's good, but it's hard to deal with. I think I found the best thing is just getting people food. Yeah. Because your wife can make Ukrainian food. Yeah, She's my wife the, is the bomb at that. Yeah. yeah. So, like, if she puts together a little mini platter, that's not going to be too much stress for her and carries it over. Hey, thanks for the sprinkler. That's it. Yeah. She's going to have to make so many pierogi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fair enough. The, the other thing, though, well, 
you can just freeze them. Yeah, and exactly. Just well, yeah, them I'll just get some frozen ones from a restaurant and just bring them over. That's another one, too. Um, well, and the interesting thing there, actually, not the interesting thing. The hard thing to figure out is if this neighbor is going to be inclined to help you out again, because otherwise you get in this weird hamster wheel of they do you a favor, you have to do them a yeah, favor, yeah, yeah, like then they the do office. you another one, and it's just like, uh, how, far, how far are we going to take this, yeah. people? Come on. But even the small talk thing, I found that if you just kind of mention, if you pay attention a little bit, and find some innocuous random thing. Like let's say they painted their name on their mailbox. Be like, oh, hey, I noticed you painted your name on your mailbox. And then have them talk about that. Be like, all right, well, I got to go. Yeah, well, small talk turns into small listen. I don't have that much interest in them. But they're they're nice. I'm not I'm not trying to shit talk them. But they're, it's a weird adjustment. Because when we lived in the East End, we had a house. It was a rental house. But I never even saw my neighbors. Ooh. Didn't know any of their names. And now everyone's coming to introduce themselves. And it's just... It's a very, very friendly neighborhood, which is good. But yeah, it's a I'm two blocks away from where my parents live. Sweet. So it's, it's it has its perks, but they can just pop in whenever they want. So it's a uh, that part's tough. The cool thing is, is that when the baby's here, the baby's your excuse. Mm-hmm. Like you find little things that'll trigger it crying, and so they try to say, "Hey, how's it going?" And then. Hell, you can even just get a recorder that's recorded the kid mm-hmm. crying, and you just keep it in your back pocket, and then you just press it. It's like, oh, no, the baby's crying again. <laughs> Got to take him inside. As long as they can't see the baby's face, I think you'll be all right. Yeah, just get out of any conversation that way. Yeah. Small talk is weird. Small talk is really weird, especially with, especially if you're not one for a small talk. It's a skill. Like, yeah. the people that are good at small talk, you're like, they can like bring you in and just make you want to mm-hmm. talk to them about who the hell knows what, but you're just like, you just start talking to them and you don't even realize it. And it seems like they know everything about everything. Yeah, or that's the other thing. about everything that it's just like, all right, like they can talk. They, you could throw them in the middle of a room and mm-hmm. they'll end up becoming friends with a lot of people. Yeah, I can't do that. It's a, it's an impressive skill. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get there. I've been listening to CBC a lot lately in the mornings. Okay. So like Sophie and I are now, you know, 50 year yeah, old parents old, that old drive to work. People, yeah. yeah. So we're like, we carpool to work every day. And so we're listening to CBC. So for the for the good chunk of that day, I at least have absorbed some information. Like, hey, what about those airlines? Yeah, eh? you have. Yeah, you have this thing, and if no one if no one's heard of it, you get to sound like a genius about it too. Totally, and like you brought the information. Mm-hmm. But I always try to do that thing where I credit where I've gotten it from because I know in the past where I've just said innocuous information, someone's like, "Oh, where'd you hear that?" I don't know, and then they just <laughs> think like I'm baiting them with a title of something yeah, yeah, like yeah. you know oh my god a grizzly bear was fighting with a tarantula the other day it's like <laughs> where'd you see that i don't know <laughs> you sound crazy yeah i still think the tarantula would win apparently there's this giant tarantula that's like the size of a person's arm and it's supposedly super nice and where did i find that i don't know some no random idea. post on something facebook he's made of facts it literally showed this spider next to this person's hand and the spider was massive and it said something along the lines of it doesn't want to hurt anybody it just wants to find a friend i was like first of all a no (laughs) no thanks have you seen the spiders around the city there's tons they're and they're massive little guys too like they're they're tiny but they're thick yeah oh yeah they got the big asses on them and they're like the long asses yeah i've never seen them before dude uh, at work the rollers in the back so like there's a manufacturing plant where i work so that's where the section the part that i work at and so i'm like hunkered over and like messing around with stencils and this fucking spider comes up from underneath right right in front of me and i'm looking and i'm not terrified of spiders my coworker is but they just i just stop and i just don't i just look at it and i watch it move and they look like they move so fast yeah they're everywhere now and grasshoppers Mm mm-hmm there's a lot of those but what are you gonna do we also have gigantic hornets so that's another thing it's they are the worst they've ever been i feel like there's actually this japanese hornet or it's called the giant japanese hornet or something they found that was in bc and there's like three of them so far and they want nothing but to destroy everything else it's they're legitimately here and they're massive i'm shitting you not like they would almost fill half this cup Really? Based on a video I saw on, and this was on like 
gl- uh, Global or something in Vancouver, something or Global Regina, but they were showcasing a Vancouver story, and they showed a video of a person with this with a cup, and it's this massive hornet that just wants to kill everything. How do they get here? I'm assuming that it's something along the lines of I think I mentioned this before, where like when they brought the koala back in the Simpsons episode, and then all of a sudden Springfield was overrun with koalas. Right, right, right. I think somebody like wanted that. to do okay, that. Yeah. Uh, also, a lot of people like to bring in exotic insects, and they think it's a cool idea until they run rampant everywhere. And it's like, oh, great. We've got vipers everywhere. Yeah. And no, not yeah I think I remember you guys talking about that one now. It sounded familiar. One? Yeah. Yeah. And I forget where or what I was mentioning, but all I can think of is that, like, that Simpsons episode. God, the Simpsons just knew what to do. Yeah, it's crazy. Except they, now. They should have given up a while ago. But it's still... I think it gets a bad rap because the old seasons were so good. Mm-hmm. The new seasons are still funny. They're not the same kind of funny. It's not like the old Simpsons seemed like they had an air of just brilliance to them. Mm-hmm. Now they're just a show that's still better than lots of the other shows. Are they? Yeah. I haven't seen any of the new Simpsons. Well, sorry. I haven't followed any of the new Simpsons yeah, yeah. stuff. I probably caught a couple episodes Yeah, that's, there. that's all I have with it too. But Same with Family Guy. I think after four or five seasons, I just stopped yeah, it's it's run its course. And like the two kind of Family Guy seemed like it was copying The Simpsons for a bit. Then The Simpsons sure. seemed like they started copying Family Guy a bit. And then mm-hmm. they kind of just blunged into the same show now. Well, what was crazy is that you almost think that they would have stopped back when the first uh, Simpsons movie came out. Because mm-hmm. that was supposed to be the finale. Yeah, that's a fine ending point. It would have been great. Call it a wrap. And they would have been, it would have gone down as like one of the greatest shows ever. It still is. But I think what's happening is its greatness is just. It's almost like Eminem, right? In a way, like Eminem, it was great, and then he ended up not being so great. Now he's kind of come back into form, but he's doing too much, and it's like, yeah, we get it, man. You're awesome. Like you're really good. You proved your point. Yeah, you got to be careful though, because hanging up a bit. Yeah, now you're doing stuff with Ed Sheeran and Fifty Cent that's not coming across very well at all. At all. Did you ever get into Eminem the way that most people did? I. Always liked rap. I always hated Eminem. You did, hey? Yeah, and I always get a bad, bad looks when I talk about. It. He's just like the problem was he came out. His first album was really good, mm-hmm. um, and then all the singles that came out were just these like gig songs, like they're just like mm-hmm. novelty tracks, like. And it's if that's your only association with them is like these novelty tracks, like he's just garbage. Right. And make me not want to go out and buy a CD because, yeah, like those, you know, which like, I don't, I can't even think of them, but like he's always in a costume and the videos are like cartoony and stupid. Well, his, uh, I know that for a while up until, okay, so he had the real Slim Shady, like, okay, so he had the, the Slim Shady LP, mm-hmm. which was hard as fuck, but yeah. it came out with Hi, My Name Is, right? Right. Um, Which at the time was like crazy. Like it was just like, this is very different. And then he had the Marshall Mathers LP, right. which was. I would say better, but he still had um, the real Slim Shady on it. I think that was the one That's, where yeah, they had yeah, like yeah. the they had the clones of him. They yeah, were making yeah. more of him because people wanted to kind of rap like him at the time. Mm-hmm. Then I think it was his relapse album where he really fell hard. What he went off the rails a bit. Yeah, he had that um, bow 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 bound and he was like running naked on the streets and stuff and doing the elvis thing and yeah that one was okay i didn't care for that album at all in the least um yeah i could see where you can i I could see i I can picture the music videos you're talking about or the tracks that you're talking about. yeah and that's when no matter how good your stuff may or may not be which it wasn't always my style anyways but it just that's always what i associate him with and i just that stuff is garbage it was hard to it was hard to break that up. Yeah, exactly. And then, so, what were you primarily into? Like, if if at the time when all of us were listening to Eminem, and then subsequently leading into like Obi Trice and Fifty Cent yeah, and D right. Twelve, like because Aftermath was huge then. Like so, Aftermath then was what top um, uh, top dog. I think it's no, not top dog. What's what's the one that's Kendrick's under? I think it's Top Dog. Is it? Um, I'll find it. But yeah. anyways, what were so you So basically, what, yeah, because what happened is Eminem, Yeah, Obi Top Dog Trice, Entertainment. Yeah, TD. 
Jesus. Sorry. And 50, yeah, 50 Cent Obi Trice, all that stuff. They came out and I just loved it, but I hated those guys. Like I, 50 Cent, his songs, I just didn't like, I, he just felt phony to me. There was something that was so fake about it. So I just tried to, that's when I started getting into what they would say underground rap or mm. less, less known rap. And I couldn't even tell you where I started with because it was just, back in the day with like, I don't know, probably the Napster days and the Kazaa oh, days. Yeah. And Kaza. <laughs> is it you, Kaza or Kaza? Every, I think I think it was because I called it Kaza. Yeah, same I'm just here. Thinking, I'm like, fuck, I remember that like it was yesterday. Yeah, and so you didn't know what the hell you were getting. So I just put in an artist's name and I'd download stuff and you'd get stuff that wasn't by them and you just mm. try to figure out who that was by and it's just these this weird stuff. And so I'd be listening to a hundred different artists and that kind of, I found the area of rap that I liked, which was just this, it still sounded the same, but it wasn't as commercialized. But it doesn't make it worse, but being commercialized. But it, it just there was a, a distance myself from it a little bit. Whereas when it wasn't as commercialized, you have a little bit more of a relation to it. Well, it's it's kind of like what the the landscape is now with hip hop, and what I'm listening to now. So, and I've said it on the on the show before, like. I can't, I have a really tough time listening to a lot of the popular stuff that's out now. So I get where you're coming from, from the, at the time when Eminem was popping, it wasn't your thing. Yeah. Now the, all the littles that are popping right. aside from little Wayne or all like the, all the, the mumble rap thing is just, it has not, it has not grabbed me at all. And it seems like a joke. And that's, that's the thing that I'm, I think it's because I'm older now is I don't see that stuff as a joke anymore. Don't it's, just, it's different. Like, yep. and I think that's the thing with rap too, or hip hop or whatever, is that it's been around for long enough now, but it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't have its own genres. Like, so rap always gets categorized in the same thing, but there's no way that Lil Wayne and White Club John are the same. Right. Sure. But they're going to be right beside each other in a, in a record store. Whereas if rock music, you have your punk and your metal and your alt pop and your pop punk and all this sort of stuff. So they all have their own categorization. So that's why it's, it's hard to say you're a fan of rap without someone thinking that you're listening to the little Uzis and stuff like that when you're right. not. Well, and it's, um, there was a, there was an intro to a song from an artist named Grammatique and he's a, he just puts beats together. Okay. And so it's, it's non lyrical, just beats. And they're really good. He's uh, I think he's from Quebec, but the, the opening on one is saying that uh, it, it was a DJ talking over it. And he's like, I had this fool come up to me at a club and ask me to put on a hip hop record while he's playing beats already. And he was saying, he's like, when I'm playing the beats, it's hip hop. When I'm doing this, it's hip hop. And you got to separate um, what is hip hop and what is the culture. Right. And I think, I made this mistake for years where everything was bundled into one. And it, in a sense, it is because it stems from like the same branch, so to speak. Like I just finished watching the last two seasons of Hip Hop Evolution on Netflix, which is really good. If no is, that, one's, is that the one that's hosted? Or, with Shad. Shad? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Shad? He's, is it Shad? It's Shad. Yeah. You introduced Shadrack me to Shad. Shadrack Cabango. Yeah. He's yeah. Fucking awesome. He's, he's great. He's got to be a top five all time for me. He's really good, man. And like he was the one that was leading the thing. And it was talking, it was showing how everything kind of stemmed from those those first moments or those first nights uh, while I think it was DJ Cool Herc who had kind of started, mm -hmm. the, the planted the seed, and then it led all the way to what it is now, right? Or what it was up until like 10 years ago and how it evolved and everything. The whole blanket or the whole kind of globe around it, you can classify as hip hop. You can even throw the mumble people in there, yeah. right? But like you mentioned, there's all these different subsets that kind of separate it. So you can't necessarily say, yeah, I like rap or hip hop or whatever. Yeah, you, you can't. At this point, you have to define what you like. And that's where it gets super pretentious with underground and independent rappers is the dorks like myself that like them is a oh, yeah, you guys don't listen to real hip hop, and that just drives me bonkers. Just like the air of, just the arrogance actually of it. Just like yeah. there's this real pretension with people that listen to independent rap. When in reality, like there's this uh, this uh, producer Jake One, um, he's on an independent album, um, record label, and he released just twenty beats, 
and he sent it up to rappers and say like, which beat do you want? Rap over it. We're going to make a mixtape. And all the underground, there was, so there were a bunch of underground guys like Slug from Atmosphere, um, MF Doom was on it, Blueprint, but then you had like Lloyd Banks was on it mm-hmm. and uh, Young, uh, some of the other uh, G-Unit guys were on it too. Mm-hmm. And you're saying literally all the guys were fighting over the same beats. So there's not really that distinction. Yeah. Well, it's funny because in this documentary, it showed there was an era where after Tribe started sampling. So after the Native Tongues formed, then Tribe ended up Tribe ended up breaking out. Everybody was rushing. There was this one hotel in New York where these guys would go like early morning and fight over records because it was the era of this is sampling. Like yeah. we're, we're sampling yeah, everything that we sample. can find. And everyone's just grabbing whatever they can. And just trying to sample, but they had so much like they had to create their beats. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like you mentioned here, they'll have twenty that are pre-made for them that they're fighting to rap over. Yeah, and it's so when people say there's a difference, it's not really, but it is. It is built up difference in your own head because it's just what you connect with more. So the beats can sometimes take a backstage to the lyrics, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes it's the other way around. So it's it's just different that way. But there is definitely a lyrical difference with a lot of the, those alt rappers, I guess you could call them is just, there's a lot more of this. And I think, I do think Eminem was pretty kind of fundamental in it is that rapping about stuff that's more real. Like he rapped about himself, like the trailer park and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm, And then mm -hmm. gave other rappers their own voice to rap, whether it was having to pay off student loans, Mm -hmm. something that a lot more kids can relate to. So that's why it's branching out. We're talking about, breaking up with a girlfriend in like seventh grade. Like there's no way you're hearing any rappers in the nineties rapping about that to the same extent. Well, at least, at least in that context, yeah. like I, I remember not, I remember going back now when I look at it and again, a lot of documentaries just in general, like I've, I've watched a lot of documentaries, even on individual artists and stuff. Uh, I think it was really said that ice T was one of the original guys that said it. It was like five more five in the morning burglars at my door, Glock mm-hmm. forty five in my dresser drawer, right? And people realize it's like, oh, this guy's talking about like I've lived through what he's talking about, right? Uh I think just Eminem ended up spinning it differently. Yeah. And then adding first of all, making it cool for white guys to like rap in the, a way. The white even guy, though, yeah, the white guy thing, he is like he's, he's probably he's the that. top one for sure, right? Yeah. But I think where where his skill is for me is just his like the beats take a backseat to his lyrics mm-hmm. all the time mm-hmm. right and i think that's a cool thing at least on his point on, like on his side because if you look at how let's say the puff daddy era was before that like after biggie died and then when they started coming out with like that hey we got a bunch of money and we're marrying flashy yes, suits like yes. the mace era that mace bad, stuff bad, yes bad 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 boy like that whole kind of weird aluminum feel music everything is so shiny and everything yeah. right uh and and then that's kind of like that part for me didn't fit i didn't really care for it as much i knew a lot of people that really liked it but my first introduction was eminem but then i would say now since 2000 and i'll say since 2011 i've actually gone back even further so now tribe is probably my top right like and then i'd go tribe and then I'd go into like the Wu Tangs, and then I'd go into the De La Souls and everything like that. So what's funny is I've actually re- gone backwards in terms of my liking of, let's say, a particular style of rap and or hip hop or whatever. Like a, a, there's a sound that they encompass. Yeah, there's just like a style to it that yeah. is ringing to you. But I mean, I got to it super late in comparison to a lot of people because I didn't have anybody to actually introduce it to me until I moved to Calgary and my sous chef. Made me a CD, which was really funny, and I still Cute have it. Too. Yeah. Asking you out on a date next. Super nice. And it had Farsight on there. Right? It had awesome. Tribe on there. It had Black Sheep on there. And not just the choice is yours, Black Sheep. Like it had some, some deeper of their, cuts. Yeah. And it was awesome. And I was like, oh my God, this is the most amazing stuff in the world. And I looked up the dates. I'm like, where the fuck have I yeah. been? Everybody needs that, that sous chef in their life. Someone that's going to yeah. like introduce them to stuff. Like it's. But yeah, there was a group of guys at our school that were listening to that less mainstream stuff, and yeah. I was able to glom onto it from them. So it's there's you got to find that that someone that's gonna burn you a CD of 
just to introduce you to what you like and find out what your style is and go from there because it's there's so much out there man it's oh crazy. man it's tons and i didn't realize how little i knew until i watched this hip-hop evolution mm-hmm. thing like it's very well done and then some of the information i had pieced together over the years but like to watch it because he goes from like the beginning yeah. to now it's it's awesome but you got me on atmosphere because i right. know you mentioned atmosphere yeah we can make a whole damn show about atmosphere That's oh my totally life. is he he is your number one he, he's oh without question atmosphere um I've been listening to, I would dare say, I've listened to at least one Atmosphere song every day for the past eight years, probably. Too, hey? Because you got me on to You Can't Believe How Much Fun We're Having. Yeah, yeah. And that was a real, like, that was a huge album. Yeah, that that was where I really got into them. I'd been kind of, again, this would have been back in, so it was back when Amazon, like, just sold CDs. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. listen to little, like, 30-second clips of every song, and I'd just be like, oh, People who bought this, I was still listening to this, and I'd just be listening to 30-second tracks all over again. And so I'd get a little piece of atmosphere, and I wasn't really into it. And then I got, yeah, you can't believe how much fun we're having. And it's been all over since then. It's been all atmosphere, everything, basically, for me. Yeah. Um, did you ever get into, my roommate got me into AC Alone. Yeah, a little bit. Um, just pieces here and there. But I, again, it just his style wasn't what I liked. Yeah. So, and then with atmosphere, too. See, I'm going to go back to it every time. Hey man, You're going to talk about something. Uh, yeah, it, back to atmosphere. Listen, it, I always try to <sighs> like find a skeleton for the conversation. Yeah, so if this, this could be the spine of the conversation, yeah, this, be, this, this is, is all you, man. This is the spine of my damn life. This is, a, this is a deep dive, dude. This is whatever um, you want it to be. So because, yeah, he's on a label called Rhyme Slayers. Yeah. And so I would go to check out his stuff on the website and then introduce me to the whole Rhyme Slayers kind of catalog and that's got to be 80 percent of what i listen to like there's mm-hmm. a, a dude brother ellie did i ever show you brother ellie no you got so, me on an atmosphere and shad uh, shad yeah shad yeah those are the two that you got me on specifically because brother ellie seems like a guy i would have been real pretentious and trying to get people to listen to but yeah, yeah he's he's on there he's this he's an albino rapper and so he just has this take on life and this view on life that's so unique being as a a white guy in black neighborhoods and not really this is a big crux of what he raps about is just being like an ugly person in mm-hmm. the eye of society or in well, his own god eyes. loves ugly yeah god loves <laughs> ugly and yeah so it's and then yeah there was rapper named uh pos and doom did some stuff on there too and so yeah that's that ended up being everything that i listened to and still basically all i really listen to now what's the closest mainstream thing you've listened to oh that's a that's a good question um mainstream i feel like i'm thinking what to do hard makes you feel like a real asshole but i can't even think <laughs> hey man, uh, i'm super pretentious about the music that i listen to so when like uh i was teaching greek dance to kids from like the the time that they were 11 years old and now yeah. they're like 18 years old and then they would come in and start like the one kid came in and started saying gucci gang and i literally kicked them out Good of class Lord, yeah i said I, I said, before I kicked them out of class, I said, you will never bring up mumble rap in this class ever. And then I told all the other kids there. So then what I ended up doing was I started playing traditional, like ni- like late 90s. Yeah. Again, very more East Coast stuff, even though I like West Coast. But I, I find that I'm gravitating. The older I've gotten, the more I'm gravitating towards East Coast. I put on Illmatic Right for the, the, the like while they're coming in, you know, before class starts, uh, I put on the tribes. I put on uh, the far side. Uh, actually, the one time the one parent got super mad because I put on oh shit, and so like it's got that intro. I was like ah shit, and then like the parent just looked at me. I was yeah. like sorry, dude. And then I got him onto like the Kendricks and the J Coles and stuff like that too. But and do they? Well, like when you're playing that that older stuff, yeah, are they paying any mind to it? Uh, sometimes towards the end of it, the one a couple times I forgot to put put it on because I was late, and a couple of the kids were like, "Hey, where was okay? You know, where was it?" Kind of thing, right? Um, one of them was like, "Oh, well, how come you never played it anymore?" Right? But you know, I didn't do it all the time, and it was a short window that I did it. But I tried to do it as much as I could to be like, "Listen to this stuff because it's yeah. really good." And yeah, this, this is-, is the stuff that I like. This is kind of like the birth of all the stuff you're listening to, kind of, but not really. It's like the the adolescence is the formidable yeah. years, right? Because that would be when it was growing into a accepted part of kind of the culture. Well, what's funny is that I found my old iPod classic and I've nice. got like 3,400 songs on there. 
and a good chunk of it was was techno stuff because before my sous chef gave me that CD, I was listening to a lot of like electronic and techno. Like, thank God he gave you that CD. <laughs> oh man! Well, the thing was, it just added to it. At that by that point, the only thing I wasn't listening to was country music, Thanks. and still to this day, I don't listen to country yeah, music. I- fucking hate it i just i i just can't do it and before i used to be super hard on it now it's just like i just can't do it only because there's been some stuff that i've listened to like johnny cash stuff um not very someone had coined it as stadium country Mm -hmm. state yeah stadium country i've heard that um just some some more quieter stuff that's more introspective and actually means something uh they got me onto that but not a lot maybe it's like five or six songs yeah. maximum but i was listening to it and then some of those songs had come in and i'm like well fuck this is where it all started mm-hmm. like i was to blame i'm going to these shows and i'm like watching these electronic shows like we'd gone to la and watched swedish house mafia for oh, their nice. last tour it was awesome it was like ten thousand people in this park but then i'm like thinking this is kind of this is this is the progression of what happened and that's why now rap quote unquote is the biggest thing right now because they just took they just rapped differently over these electronic beats blended the two together and they're like hey marketable yeah no exactly they're... and i'm just like fuck i was there when it started and i didn't even see it yeah it's the the blending like that's what rap's done because of the sampling and stuff rap can do not better but basically only like you can't mm-hmm. really sample stuff so like you have them throwing in techno you have them throwing in the acoustic style rap they mm. are speeding up samples from the seventies and the sixties and stuff like that. So you can get different little taste buds from everywhere else. Well, and that, and that's the interesting thing because I was listening to, I forget which podcast it was, but there was an African American student who had graduated from, um, like he was, he was in from Toronto. Uh, um, I think he was, Anyways, he was he was talking about because he went to like Stanford and he ended up becoming like going from being a little young gangster to being like super successful. And uh, he was talking about the idea of cultural appropriation in rap music or how people were like keep saying like, oh, like the white person has taken the rap songs and right. stuff. But it's like, but you guys have appropriated the albums from all these other genres Mm -hmm. and created your like you guys have brought the lyrics for sure but your beats have underlings of everything from before that so you could argue that the rap landscape of the 90s let's say specifically that was heavy into the sampling appropriated the music from other areas, exactly, whether it yeah. was, you know, uh, just jazz or gospel or whatever. And it wasn't just African-Americans that were pumping out these albums. Right. So I thought that was super interesting. That, yeah. No, that is a good point. I like that. That was his point. Yeah. Again, I'm still trying to like work it out, but I was just like, fuck, you're right. Cause they were talking about Elvis too. They're the, on that thing. They were talking, they were complaining how people were, or how the reality is Elvis took a bunch of like, mm-hmm. like he appropriated, um, the rock that was coming out from African Americans yeah, and yeah, turned and I, it into his own. I thing. couldn't name any of those. Me neither. Those people, but then from what I've gathered, is that yeah, Elvis Presley was kind of, mm, let's say, hijacking some of that style a mm-hmm. little bit, and then James Brown, from what I've gathered, it just took it to the that black and proud type spot, and yeah. they kind of made it their own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he ended up evolving it. Yeah, yeah. That was a, there was a, that era. Where there was a lot of evolution going on, which thank God for those guys. But then I look at it, and again, you've got this mixing and blending of all of this stuff, and it's just like, well, it no longer belongs to any one subset. It just kind of belongs to the people. Yeah, in a that's way, true. But it's really hard to separate, at least for me, and it's really hard to find. It's it's hard to separate the good stuff from the bad stuff sometimes because at least a lot of it blends together as one. Like my buddy loves it. He'll love a lot of the stuff that comes out and I just can't. Like I remember putting out a, I'm not a Facebook user very much, but I used one where it's like the Mugatu from, the Mugatu line from Zoolander 
where he's like La Tigra, Blue Steel. It all it's the same look, and he's like, it's one look. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> and I said the same thing, and I was like, uh, Future, uh, this person, um, Migos, they all sound the same. It's all the same song. It's really hard for me to get into it. Yeah, and it it does just tend to blend and bleed and become the same thing. Like you mm. just if you're not listening to it regularly yep. as the old person outsiders that we become it just it all sounds like the same thing but when you're in it like it there's nuances and there's subtleties that you notice that we just don't yeah but i don't know i try to listen to it with the same ears that i listen to the stuff which is now older and again it keeps getting older and older and older like i was listening today to um a if you like or a more like a tribe called quest um playlist on google play oh man it was going it went from big daddy kane to super early outcast to most deaf to black star talib quali common like everywhere and i'm just like it's stuff i've heard and i didn't know who who it, who, was. Who it was from stuff i've never heard before because it was super deep cuts of stuff and stuff i've heard and everything like that that i haven't heard for a long time but i knew who did it, where it was from and everything. And it was just like, it was so wild and how good a lot of it was, right? Has Spotify, because Spotify has changed my music again, back sort of like in those those Napster and Kazaa days we were talking about where it just, it kind of dictated your music by what you could actually download. Yeah. Have you found that you found anyone new on Spotify with like the made for you playlist or artist like playlist that they have? Has there been someone that's new that's come across to you? No, most of the time I get it from my buddy Ethan. Yeah, because he's he always finds the newest music like Kanye is dropping an album on Friday and I had no idea. And he no told idea. me and there was a new one that came out from Gangstar. Really? Brand new one. Oh, dude, it is outstanding. And it, it's featuring J. Cole. It's called. It's called Family and Loyalty. And it's Gangstar featuring J. Cole. It is the most East Coast sounding track. No it is outstanding, man. But anyways, and he told me about it, and he usually kind of keeps me up to date on a lot of stuff, which is sweet. So that's usually where I get most of my newer stuff now. But I don't even know if I meant newer in terms of release date. I meant newer in terms of like new to you. um, Well, this playlist one, because most of the time I don't really mess around with the playlist. Like, this is what it looks like. So it tells me like, oh, similar to Lo-Fi Loft. That's kind of the stuff that I'll play at home. Um, For fans of Lauryn Hill, and it'll just do a bunch of similar to beats without Mm -hmm. rhymes and stuff. Today was kind of the first time where I actually dove into one of those playlists. And there was a bunch of stuff on there. I'll even show you some of the screenshots I took. Because that's what absorbs a lot of my energy on Spotify is the like need you for you some, playlists and stuff. Yeah. if you, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, though, for the oh, past. This is, yeah, this is losses. Like, yeah, Blackstar on here, which was one of my first ones. Talib Kweli was, was a funny one for me. Because I love Talib Kweli, but it's. You start listening to those as a teenage white kid, yeah. and you start thinking you're black power all over the place, and I like <laughs> got myself all mixed up. See, what's funny is like I got the opposite, where yeah. I felt super bad listening to it. <laughs> but well, it's like- Because you didn't think it was for you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But then it goes into, what is it, Jurassic 5? I've never heard of Jurassic 5. What? They're outstanding. You've never heard of them, huh? This is how, this is how behind I am on a lot of this stuff. It had some Rakim, obviously. Um, they had some deep cut Buster Rhymes on here. Um, Black Star, I listened to a lot, and I actually listened to a lot of Black Star before my sous chef gave me that CD. Right, my iPod's got a ton of stuff on there, and then a lot of the stuff on the early days before Kanye became Kanye, before College Dropout, and right. it was him and Common doing stuff. And he's always doing a Talib Kweli and stuff. And, yeah, exactly. And I was huge into well, when Chappelle Show was out, right? I did listen to Most Def a lot. Yeah, or I, I I liked Most Def quite a bit. But I didn't know that there was any, I didn't know there was any separation between the artists. I just thought, like I said, I put it all in one blanket yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. And then I just discovered new people. I'm like, oh, these guys are good and these guys are good. And then you discover that they work together and mm-hmm. you're like, holy shit, this is awesome, right? And that's what I think Kanye West might have been a big, like college dropout must, was huge for, for rap because you had huge. Talib Kweli who was a... Let's say a niche legend, common, most F, all those guys are. For sure. But guys like 
Well, the, it's funny. Most people know Mos Def. Most people know Mos Def, but don't know Talib Kweli. Yeah, exactly. And those guys were literally linked for years. Years, yeah. And then, but then he put them on tracks with Jay Z. Yeah. And who else was on that album? Like um, there was. Well, let's look it up. I know they had Freeway and stuff. Like, I'm specifically he makes a, a line about it, like putting Common on a track with with somebody famous. Like it's he took those two worlds, like the quote unquote underground and the quote unquote mainstream. Mm-hmm. And made one full album out of it. He had Consequence and GLC. Right. Because um, I know Jamie Foxx is on. Is that the one that's going to nope. be on there? The, uh, Get Him High. That's a Talib Kweli. Right. And Common. Yeah. That was the two of them. Which I don't think they did anything together up until then. He had Ludacris and Breathe In, Breathe Out. Right. Yeah. So he just had all these, yeah, these, these quote unquote mainstream and these lesser known guys and he brought them together in yeah. one of the best albums ever it is it is still yeah. actually all three of them i think are really good but this one is still the best i remember my birthday came out with late registration and i was it was like the best mm-hmm. birthday present ever that was i think when we were in grade 12 because i remember Dear going Lord. to play squash with justin todd and listening to that <laughs> album <laughs> We were going to because I like we had like I had like a second period and a third period spare right. that led into lunch. So my day was like go to class just for eight a.m., two spares and lunchtime, and then fourth and fifth. It was amazing. It was like the best half of the. And you want to play squash on your? We go play squash. It was awesome. Nice. Actually, it was pretty decent. Even though Justin ripped me to shreds, he's yeah. like a professional player right now. Yeah, he's one of the best people in Canada at the time. Yeah, he's so good. Yeah, I don't know. It's it, it was guys like him for sure that ended up bringing the whole kind of the whole thing together a lot of it which was sweet yeah that's what i found with that album too and it, yeah it holds up like i honestly don't think the other ones hold up as well as that one holds up um i don't 808s and heartbreaks doesn't hold up for me no uh, it didn't hold up at the time <laughs> yeah except for like two tracks yeah um dark twisted fantasy still holds that's, up for me yeah, but that's, that's also good. a little bit newer mm-hmm. that was 2009 yeah i couldn't tell you years. that's the toughest thing but uh, yeah, for me it goes college dropout, late registration, not in any order, then graduation, and then you've got Dark Twisted Fantasy. Like those are the four. Those are the Kanye ones, yeah. and everything else has been very experimental. And I I just haven't been able to get into it. No, not at all. Like they're you're you're you kind of nailed it. Those are when I think of Kanye West in a positive. Like those are the four I think of. Yeah, everything else is like. Kanye West as a sideshow. Yeah, well, and recently his newest stuff that he came out with when he did, it was him, Pusha T, Kid Cudi. Like he did that six track yeah, rollout. Yeah, yeah. I, it I was, tried. It was okay. It was better than Life of Pablo and Yeezus for sure. Yeah. But it was still like, I don't know. I think I think what's weird, and um, I was listening to somebody on Rogan talk about how you know our artists evolve. But we don't want them to. We want yes. them to keep pumping out the same sound yes. that they've been doing. And I, I was listening to those three just after I listened to that Kanye rollout. I think that was in May, maybe. When did Sounds that push? Right. Was it around that Pusha T album? Because that one was said, a good one. Mm, maybe even before that. Maybe before that. Yeah. So then, I listened to the three of them after, plus Dark Twisted Fantasy, and I was like, "What? The f- like, what happened?" I don't understand what happened. Can I blame Kim Kardashian for it? Like, are we able to blame the Kardashians for for the downfall of Kanye West? Well, I, I like I said, I consider those like the Kardashian albums. Like, yeah. they're they're not Kanye albums. They're mm. I'm married to a superstar. I'm going to put out music albums. Yeah, yeah, it's super weird. It's the, super weird. The evolution of. is a funny thing too, because uh, with underground rap, it's all the fans are like, oh, why aren't these guys more popular? Why aren't these guys more popular? Mm-hmm. And they get more popular mm-hmm. sometimes, and everyone falls off. Mm-hmm. No one likes them anymore. But it's, are they, they really lease an out. Like, Atmosphere, we're coming back. It's um, all right. It's, uh, like, they're, you'll read the comments like, oh, this stuff is garbage. What's happened to old Atmosphere? Well, technically now Atmosphere is old. He's like 40-something now. Like, yeah. Slug is 40. And so he's got his new album. He's got a song about, Trying to have, trying to find time to have sex with his wife. Right. And like they have to like plan babysitters so they can have alone time and stuff like that. And it's like, there's no way that God Loves Ugly Slug is rapping like that. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. So they have to evolve because their lives are changing. So the music and what they're rapping about, what they're singing about, that's going to have to change too. Well, that's what you can't imagine how much fun we're having was like 
that's a turning point, I think, for a lot of that would be the turning point, I think, for a lot of fans because he had he had he had quit drinking, wasn't it then, or was he on the way to quitting drinking? He was because he was the reputation of like the the groupie party rapper, yeah, and so the title was almost a joke on that. Like everyone's imagining how much fun he's having, having yeah. being this guy that's he got compared to like the Anthony Kiedis of the underground rap. He was just, girls were swarming him. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's supposed to be this dream life and he's just done with it. So mm-hmm. I don't know if he gave up the vices, but he'd given up the lifestyle at that point. Cause he had that one track that I like, that's still amazing to this day. And I highly recommend everybody listening to it where he was writing the letter to himself oh, yeah, that's, his, or his dad. Fuck that's His dad, his son and himself. Yeah. That's, it gives me chills still to this day. Yeah. It's so good. Actually, there's so many on that album that are like, they give you the chills. Sorry if it cut out right then and there. I wasn't paying attention. So Atmospheres, That Night. Yeah, so that that's a track about a, a fan of his that got essentially raped and murdered after one of his shows. Mm-hmm. And it was a fan of his. And this song is a... It's a lot of... Like, I don't want to say dedication because that kind of makes it too lighthearted sounding. But it was just like this real internal look at like the ugliness in the world. And that there's this vibe like, yeah, I love my fans. But like... One of my fans did that too. One of my fans was at the show and did that to another fan. Right, and the, and one of my other fans died as a consequence yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that was the one in Albuquerque. The music died that mm-hmm. night in Albuquerque. Yeah, that's a crazy one. I remember playing that for Mac, my roommate, when I was living in Calgary, and he got hooked because of the beat. Because mm-hmm. it's, it's it's a damn good song. Like it just sounds. Yeah. it's got like this. Oh, it just gets in your bones. Like well, it sounds so cool. Fuck it. Just a quick little... Copyright. Like that rolling drum. Mm-hmm. Like... And now when part kicks in. That drum is so good. Mm-hmm. Like it's such lo-fi, but like... Yeah, it's really good. It's such a visceral sounding song yeah. too, like, but it it just sounds depressing in a way. Like you almost picture those old uh, gangster shows where it's like an alleyway and it's raining, right? Yeah, and someone's like walking through it. That's it's uh, noir style. Yeah, that's crazy. How that's how it makes you feel. I've never been able to put into words, but that's exactly like you get that. The noir style to it. Yeah. Like they're sitting, because he's talking about how they're sitting in that bus and everything like that, but it's like all you can picture is just, yeah, that just this long hallway this or this long alleyway. alleyway and just rain and it's just black and white and there's lightning and just super depressing and super like this world is ugly. Kind of mm-hmm. reminds me of a David Fincher movie. Like, have you seen Seven? Nope. I highly recommend watching Seven. It Everyone still holds up. That I watch it. Yeah. But it's like, I would say that the events of that, even though they happen in Albuquerque, are events that would happen in the world of Seven because it doesn't actually tell you where it's right. what the city is, and it's got that same feel. It's just almost always raining, always right. dreary, yeah, yeah. and just this. It's just an ugly, ugly world. It's just crazy. But besides that song, they're not they're not quite as dark. That's the darkest song. Yeah. The rest is there's he's got this good quote about that album because <clears throat> from his standpoint, that's where. He went a lot. Sorry, do you want more scotch? Let's do it. Let's do it. He went away from his uh, real, like, he he kind of represented, like, I know you're talking about the show on your show at the, our school, like the smokers that just yeah. seem like they're smarter than everyone. Yeah. He kind of represented that kind of subgenre of people that listen to rap music. And you can't imagine how much fun we're having is where he got away from it. Mm-hmm. And he was taking criticism for it. And he compared it to putting vitamins in Twinkies. Cause he's like, I'm still saying the same shit, but mm-hmm. I have these beats that are a little bit more fun and a mm-hmm. little bit more vibrant. So you take all the grossness or all the the stuff you love that you hate or hate that you love, and then you fill it with the stuff that you actually like or the stuff that you need. And that's I thought it was the best quote because it was his first time really going to more upbeat and more, let's say, commercial mainstream type beats. But then he's still saying a lot of cool stuff on it. Was it musical chairs that? Because when you mentioned that, like those roles and stuff, I think musical chairs played along with those roles. Um, 
Maybe. I don't remember now. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, Susie was a genius or whatever. Yeah. She wanted to prove it. It was talking about like how like the kid is the smartest kid in class and everyone was like kind of with them, but they weren't with them and stuff. And it, it was actually really cool because I'm like, oh, I know that person. I know that yeah. person. I know that person. He does a really good job of representing archetypes of people in your life. That's the pet. Yeah, that's what it is. Archetypes. Yeah. and then, But he never says it directly. And it's an mm. indirect route that he gets there. But you're like, yeah, I know that person. Well, and I didn't know about the like the women and stuff in his life, aside from the one that he wrote about uh, to his son about his mom and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I um, I think you were the one that was telling me about Angel Face, and wasn't that about a prostitute? I don't, I don't. If I told you that, I was probably making it up. <laughs> <laughs> you really wanted like, to well, sell like, me on the album? No, the thing is, I because I that was when you had a lot of free time, and yeah, I was true. getting my taste in music, so I would look up hours and hours of shit about stuff that I was interested in and obviously this was something at the time well and we kept going to your uncle's place your mm-hmm. uncle's giant house and listening to music in his living room and in the basement mm-hmm. was it your place that we were playing Def Jam yeah Def Jam and Def Jam Vendetta yeah Def Jam Vendetta sweet yeah those games are so those good those games are so good but yeah we were listening to those a lot I forget what we were even playing I just remember sitting around that table like I I viscerally remember or I vividly, sorry, remember sitting around that table and having it play, like atmosphere play in the background, just on loop. Yeah, I remember like, your reaction to it. You're, yeah. You're like, your eyes just got like, why? You're like, oh, and then mm. I think that's when you got turned. Yeah, that was probably the beginning of it. Yeah. Because I think well, you like, got turned I, at least onto Atmosphere's music. Yeah. Or even just like the thing is that it encompasses a sound, right? Like just like when you go to East Coast, East Coast it encompasses a sound, West Coast encompasses a sound. Uh, the dirty South encompasses a sound like all of like, there's just a sound that I'm I'm finding the older I'm getting. It's it's less about East, West, or South or whatever, or Central. It's or Canada or whatever. It's it's a I don't know. It's this blend of what the beat is and how the lyrics are flowing mm-hmm. with it and what the lyrics are now that are just like, yep, that's it for me. Yep. Which is I would say better for me than before because I'm feeling like. I can open open myself up to just stuff because if it sounds good and everything fits together and like, and especially if the lyrics come together, because obviously you're gonna like it's like a like a plate of food. First you got to see it, mm-hmm. and if it looks good, then you're gonna be like, oh shit, I want to eat this thing, right? Then you eat it, and you're like ingesting it, and you're kind of like curious about what you're eating, and yeah. you might like some bites more than the others. But really, the key is that after part, and it's like, do you have? Are you satisfied? Or sorry, did you hate it? Are you satisfied? Or do you feel a sense of wanting more or longing? And I know that's one of the things that um, it was in the movie Burnt with Bradley Cooper. And he's like, I want people to have a sense of longing for my food. Right. Like they are going to be devastated for the fact that they can't have this all the time or that they've experienced something that they may never experience again. And they might have missed it in that moment. And so a lot of the times with with the way I'm like ingesting music now, it's okay. It starts off and it sounds good. Beats pretty good or whatever. Then I'm like processing the beats, with the lyrics and ingesting it. And then after I'll kind of carry it with me and see how long it carries afterwards and how much I'd keep doubling back to it. Have you ever had the speaking of that ingesting and, and taking it all in? Have you ever read a song that you loved? There's a song that was like one of your a song you always listen to. Mm-hmm. And it's not to like your 20th time or listening for years they actually realized what they were, what the song was about all the time. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh, like almost every song, almost every song now that I might have listened to when I was younger, it's just like, yeah. oh, that's what that meant. Yeah, there's this one song. I'm gonna see if I can figure out what it is by Brother Lou, who I was talking about before, and I always just thought it was like the nicest love song ever. And then as I got into it, and I listened to it more. I realized about him stalking a girl. Perfect. And it's amazing. What's it what's it called here? Prince Charming. Prince Charming. It's called Prince Charming. It's got like this cool, cool vibe to it. And it sounds like it's like this nice, like bluesy, jazzy, like love song. Mm-hmm. And he just and then you start listening to the lyrics and like, yeah, I know you're home because I was outside your window and stuff. And but it still sounds like romantic the way he says it. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, it's uh and yeah, I get this all the time. Like songs I love, I'm like, oh, there's a little line in here you didn't notice before that's like, oh, that's like a whole different level now. A lot of it is the metaphors. 
that I don't understand. That I, I don't still get. don't understand. Someone can explain it to me. I never understand. I'm, and and I'm some of them are obviously it. cultural, like how they grew up and how they spoke mm-hmm. amongst each other. And so it means differently than what we would think, you know, from yeah. the middle of nowhere, Canada. Um, the one, it, it's funny because it's almost exactly like every Greek song. Because every Greek song sounds super nice. Yeah. And it's super fucking depressing. Like, <laughs> there's there's like nice nice instruments in the background. Everyone's having a good time. It seems like everyone's having a good time. And the funny thing is, people dance this shit at weddings. Like at my wedding, I actually told my DJ like a lot of these really popular songs. I kind of don't want you to play them because they're the complete antithesis of what we're doing here. Right? Yeah. Because I'll be at these weddings. They'll be playing these songs, and I'm like. This is about the girl leaving the dude and now his life is ruined and everyone seems to be like celebrating the happy couple on behalf of this song in mm-hmm. that moment. And it's super funny. But you look and listen to these lyrics. It's just brutal. Like there's we actually call them like the, in, in Greek, like we call them music to slit your wrist to because they're just so depressing. But the thing is, they're so beautifully crafted. And so when someone hears it, it's like, oh, that sounds wonderful. It's is so that a love song? Yeah, yeah not really. Yeah, we found that too. I I can't pull any of the names, but like when you're trying to find our first dance song, mm-hmm. we're like, oh yeah, this song is beautiful. Everyone's gonna love it. And then you're like, it's about someone cheating. <laughs> or like Carol's yeah. Whisper, for example. That's like the pinnacle yeah. example of this. Is like it's it's so beautiful and the the horn and everything, it just sounds so great. But then yeah, it's about infidelity. I know. It's crazy. There's so many of them. And especially the R and B songs. Yeah. So What's funny is recently, in terms of new music, I've been very much more into R&B. Oh, really? Um, aside from my favorite album so far this year is from uh, Rhapsody. You ever listen to Rhapsody? I listened to her a little bit, like I, just on like features and stuff. Yeah. she Her album, Layla's Wisdom, is really good, but her newest one, Eve, is outstanding. Yeah. Like, it is, it is the equivalent to when Kendrick came out with Good Kid, Mad City. Not as good as that, but I'm saying like... So Kendrick Section 80 was good, like was really good for a breakout. Mm-hmm. And then Good Kid Mad City was huge as a sophomore. Layla's Wisdom for her was really good. And then this Eve album is like, damn, like this could potentially be album of the year if right. you know those were chosen fairly and everything. Because if that was the case, then Royce the Five Nine would have won right, for both. I was waiting for Royce. I was just looking at my watch and bring up Royce. He's he's probably gonna be one of my like he's one of my tops right now. I, I I don't know. There's something about Royce. He's, just the way he's that he, so good. He's never one that I got super into, but he'll if I was making a playlist, he'll always sneak his way onto a playlist or something like that. I'll never yeah. seek him out really, but he's. Uh, I got introduced to him not even from the Marshall Mathers LP when they did Bad Meets Evil, but when they came out with the second Bad Meets Evil, like when they came out uh, Welcome to Hell, the mm-hmm. sequel, and I was like damn, this fucking Royce guy's really good. So then I looked him up and I went back to all of his stuff. And like his older stuff was good. Lyrically, he's always been good, but it Mm -hmm. seemed like there was a mismatch of his rap style and the beats that were chosen for him. Right. And then now it seems like in the past, I would say at least 10 years or more, he's been able to just match himself with just the perfect beats. Yeah. Yeah. And even when he was with Slaughterhouse, like they all picked really good beats in Slaughterhouse. Which is too bad, like they broke up because like their stuff was really good. It, yeah, I, I Slaughterhouse is like the last year for me. I actually got into them. Yeah, hey. um, they're yeah. I never liked any of those guys really solo besides Royce a little bit, but yeah. I've gone and I've started listening to because that's Joel Ortiz, right? He's in there. Yeah, Joel Ortiz, Crooked I've, Eye, Joe Budden, and Royce. And Joe Budden was the funny one. Yeah, like and in terms of like when I saw that, I was like. Pump it up is on. Yeah, it's group. weird that Joe Budden's like a decent rapper. Or yeah, he's, all no, he, he is. is like up. he's actually quite good. Like even even Pump It Up lyrically is is really it's actually pretty good. Yeah, but, but when, you would never know. <laughs> no, of course not, because it's all it is is like they say Pump It Up like fifty <laughs> times in that fucking thing. Like it was like um the song Wangsta from Fifty Cent. I don't remember any of the lyrics except for the fact that he just says Wangster over yeah, and over again. Exactly. Or like any Jaw Rule song. <laughs> Oh, Ja Rule. I always feel like he got a untimely demise. Yeah, and it all started with Fast and the Furious, too. When they got him in there, and then something happened to his career, and then they ended up replacing him with Ludacris. With Ludacris. Well, what happened to his career is 50 Cent. Oh, yeah, that's another one, too. 50 Cent just that beef. buried him. Like, actually buried him. Yeah. Stole everything from him and left him with nothing. Because Ja Rule was, he was getting his own label. He had just signed Nas. Yep, and, and he had Fat Joe with him, too. Yeah, Fat like Joe was being prominent. So that's uh, I always feel like 
that always made me resent 50 Cent a little bit more. Not that I necessarily looking back to the rule was that good, but at the time, yeah, I feel like he got a undeserved uh, downfall. Well, and what's funny is that the more the older I get, the more I realize um, than that line that Jay Z had, where it's like, "I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman," mm-hmm. and so every business has a bunch of people that work for them. And so, like, if you take down a rapper, yeah, that's fine if it's, like, one-on-one and let's say your guys aren't that big and you're in the streets and you're battle rapping or whatever because it doesn't matter. You go home, you pick yourself up or whatever. But let's say for Ja Rule, Ja Rule's name or Murder, Inc. essentially failing because I don't think it's around at all now. If it is, it's... Who knows what the fuck it is, Yeah, it's making the equivalent of... Directed DVD movies in the yeah. music form, is there? Actually, find at yeah. a gas station or something. <laughs> yeah, actually, like the CDs at the front of them, <laughs> or like you go to what is it? It's not HMV anymore. It's Sunrise. Sunrise. For yeah. those of you who still go to CD, to go buy CDs like I do, uh, and they've got like, oh, you spent fifty dollars, have this free mm-hmm. CD or this CD for two dollars, but you take down him for how big they were at the time. There's a lot more ancillary people that you're taking down, like. The family that he has to feed and yeah. the people that puts clothes on their backs and everything like that based off that business that he's been able to run. Not to say that it should take away from the actual game itself because the argument could be made if he was worth a damn, he would have just come back and right. been able to do something. Yeah, like that's that. that's always my – why I never feel as bad for him because if there was – if he had something to him, then yeah. he would have he would have captivated his audience again and he just didn't. For sure, yeah. Well, because even when Drake and Pusha had their stuff, like Pusha is less known than Drake, especially now, mm-hmm. and their beef didn't bury anybody. Like Pusha's still gonna do his own th- stuff. Like, it just seems like he's going up against Drake, who I really don't care for Drake. I only liked Drake when he was in features back in the day, like when he would be like he'd have his thirty second bit. When he showed up on the Nicki Minaj, what is it, the Pink Pink Friday? Maybe his moment for life. He's awesome on that. Oh and he, yeah, and he showed up on Rick Ross's what is it, Teflon Don or whatever. Well, and even Tinashe awesome. when he had that remix of Tinashe's Two On. Yeah, his uh, his because they had it was Tinashe and Schoolboy Q, and then Drake ended up having a special feature on it, and that version is really good. Not to say that Schoolboy Q's version wasn't good because I like Schoolboy yeah. Q, but the Drake version on that was really good. But I always found him really good as a as a as a guy that just features here yeah, and there or he, does a hook. He has awesome features and, and like everything. Good hooks too. Yeah. That's why yeah. he, he is good for that. Yeah. And, but like, I don't know, it just never really. So when Pusha was going after him, I'm like, fuck, finally. Yeah. Take this guy down. Somebody like, get him. But whereas Ja Rule kind of never recovered from it, Push is going to keep going and he's going to, for lack of a better term, push it forward. <laughs> yes. I feel like even yes. sitting on that one. But yeah. anyways, I was so choked. Royce never even got nominated for anything. I Can you think. imagine I think a got, day where he would? I thought he was going to for um, like that year when he came out with Booker Ryan. Yeah. At, even even just for cocaine alone. Yeah, you would talk about loving that song. Loved it. But, even, but the other thing too is that he had a full album, which I guess they haven't been able to quantify what a full album is anymore. I mean, before the, – or uh, just put proper um, – things in place so an ep used to be what less than 40 minutes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now they're just pumping out less than 40 minute albums right for six out al- like right and most of them got nominated for like album of the year or whatever that year i don't remember i don't think he got nominated for anything and he put out like a full project that i would say is better than anything that came out that year at least and i might be biased but like lyrically sonically the way that it was formed everything on it it was, it was just I don't know. I just thought it was really, really good, like that, start to finish. That goes into your rhapsody point. Like they're never, there's not a, a certain level of fairness to a lot of that stuff. For sure, yeah, no, definitely, and and that's why it's kind of sad, and that's why I don't think it matters anymore. No, well, I mean, nobody who won the last rap Grammy or the I one before that or the one before that. No one yeah. knows. No one cares. The only thing I was excited for the last. Grammys or the Rap Awards or whatever it was was that her one because I love her H dot E dot E dot R. She's like an R B singer. Yeah, this girl is like she's like nineteen years old. Okay, and I think she might be twenty now, maybe even twenty one. 
And her, the content in her songs are stuff you'd hear from like a 30 year old that's gone through five divorces. <laughs> like, yeah, she is, I would argue she is the Lauren Hill of today. Right. I thought SZA was going to do it. I don't know if you've ever listened to SZA. Mm, I've only heard the name. I don't know any of the music. Her album Control was really good. Uh, it had a really great song called Drew Barrymore in it. And Drew Barrymore was in the music video. But it was really good. And she was also on the All the Stars song with Kendrick Lamar. Okay. Um, but her, everything she's, she's put out is outstanding. It's so good. And I'm finding like anything new is primarily R&B coming from her. To- really? Okay. It's uh- very good. Yeah. Because I've heard, I've seen all spotlights on her and stuff, but I've never listened, so that might be. I would highly recommend into. it, man. She's like, I would even start with a, a "Free" is one song I would just start with, and you can get a feel for it. And I think she was, I think she had just turned eighteen or nineteen when she did that song, and you're listening to it like just how mature her voice is, right? Blows you away. Because the first time I listened to her, I'm like, oh, like where the hell has she been this whole time? Oh wait, she was a child this whole time. She still kind of is comparatively, right. you know, to my 31 year old ass. But <laughs> yeah, she's a kid now. Dude, she is outstanding. Tops. So I think she won okay. and I was super happy. But, anyways, Royce needs some fucking love, people. That's all I'm saying. Now, we talked about 50 Cent ending Ja Rule. Now, yeah. did you give a shit about the Machine Gun Kelly and Eminem going at each other? I did and I didn't. I was in I was on my honeymoon at the time, so I didn't get a chance to see like hear it till after. So I had to like I didn't get it live. Right. I had to kind of go back, which was probably for the best. From what I understand, Eminem brought up something from a while ago and MGK thought that it was over, but it was kind of one of those things where it's like he's not forgotten shit. And I don't know why I know some people like did you ever do you ever listen to the Joe Budden podcast? Or no, I you? don't. No, no. I used to. Now I don't anymore. I don't remember why I stopped. But they were saying how, and they just don't like Eminem. Like, it, it, whatever he puts out, they're just going to say it's not that good. Right. Um, that him and Logic. Like, they'll just, if Eminem and Logic put something out, he if they do it. listen to it, they'll just shit on it because, right? And a lot of it is because Button blames Eminem for the fall of Slaughterhouse and all that stuff, right. which, okay, I can understand. Um. But I think Eminem destroyed him both times. I don't think that that what was his what was MGK's kill shot. Yeah. Or, or rap was that devil. M&M's? That was Eminem's rap devil right. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, rap devil. Something like that. Anyways, uh, oh yeah, because he was rap god, so he mm. came out with him, right? Yeah, clever. I didn't care for it. Like I they, don't care for MGK whatsoever. Me neither. So. You? But did, like, did, did, did it? It meant nothing to me. It was nice. So I do like the idea of someone taking a shot mm-hmm. at. The rap god is dumb with this. But like people shooting. You did above, call him out on that song though. So someone I mean, shooting above their target and yeah. at least hitting the target. Yeah. And that there's something pretty cool about that. I think MGK sucks. Uh well, sorry, I always hate saying that. I don't care for his music. But Eminem just it's effortless for him. That's why I kind of wish when he came out with his uh what was the fucking last one? That was terrible. He had that fucking album to close out his recovery thing. It was like recovery. Was it relapse? No, it was relapse, recovery, and then revival. Right, right, right. Yes. Fuck, was that a terrible album? I've never album. seen Eminem fans get so annoyed by an album before. They everyone hates that. It was awful. Everything. I don't even know why he's working with Ed Sheeran. I have no problem with Ed Sheeran at all. I think he's super talented. And from what I understand about his concerts, like he does everything himself. Mm-hmm. So that's super fucking impressive because I have a tough time whisking eggs and pouring my coffee. So like, good on you, man. He can rap too. Sure. But I mean, like, I don't know. Everything that they've put out together, I just do not like. I don't know why he's doing, especially like that whole revival album was him working with other people, which I understand like you're mixing stuff, but it wasn't even that good. Like it didn't even fit. No, it seemed like they... It's like, Although it's probably what they did. Like they recorded them in two different cities and then some guy tried to match it together. Kind of wish technology wasn't where it was so people can actually meet in the studio and do their yeah. shit. I feel like if they did something like that, I'd, you'd notice it. It would get this yeah. acclaim to it and people would recognize it a little bit more. Yeah, it's really interesting right now to see what's going on with a lot of these artists. 
and the way that they interact with each other because it is just that. Like they're just, they they can record it, send it to the other person. It's great quality. They have mm-hmm. their own studios to do yeah. it. And then they just splice it in. But I don't know. My thing with Eminem recently has been, aside from his last album, Kamikaze, which I thought was like, okay, good. Like it's a good thing you didn't go out with Revival because right. fuck you, man. Like Kamikaze, I actually liked. I enjoyed quite a bit. I didn't love it, but I thought it was good. It was a good return to form. Um, for some reason, ever since he's been on this cipher thing for the past almost eight years, it seems like every time he's trying to rap, he's trying to rap a cipher over a structured beat. 100%. Yeah, I feel like that as well. And it always just seems off. And I know he's fast enough that he can pick it up. So if you were to look like at a at a straight line and then just a bunch of loops there, mm-hmm. he brings it back whenever the loop connects with the line, but then he veers then off he goes in off cipher and bit. then he comes like he's trying to do two different things and maybe he's trying to bleed the things together, but he hasn't found the right beat per minute or he hasn't found the right beat in general yeah. to service that. Because I don't even know what kind of beat would actually work that's an interesting the, point. With the free flowing nature of a cipher. I was talking to my friend Ethan about that because we talk about this shit all the time. I'm just like, I don't get it, dude. Like, I don't know why everything sounds off. Like, he's off by a hair. And I mean, Wu Tang was off. Like, their their songs or their beats and stuff, it wasn't perfectly synced up, but it sounded perfect. I don't know what it was. They managed to, like, sound perfect with just off beats. Yeah. And off, like, just being off by a little bit here and there. But. It sounded like it was flawless. Yeah, it hits the right way. Oh, God. Yeah, Wu-Tang forever. Those guys are so good. Those guys are like, I think the one, the few that are able, that were able to actually do a thing together and then do individual projects that were stellar. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anyone that would put in the same tier of... NWA might be the first to do it. Right. There wasn't as many, like Wu-Tang has... 900 freaking members but <laughs> they're yeah. almost like brock hampton is now do you listen to brock hampton <laughs> no they're like a boy band essentially okay um they got rid of one of their guys but they've got saturation one two and three which came out the same year which is part of the saturation like saturating whatever right all three albums very good okay yeah right but they're like there's a lot of them in there and are they, like, is it straight up a boy band, like pop music boy no, band? No, 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 it's actually rap. It is rap, okay. Yeah, it, it's rap, and then there's some R&B in there and okay, stuff, okay. but they've got some really cool sounds. They've got, like, it, it's very independent. They're, I don't think they're on any label. Like, they're kind of chance they're rappering it in right. a way where they are they just do their own thing. They throw it out. You can't find their CDs anywhere, I don't think, because they just put it out online and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they're really good, but I haven't seen what they're doing individually. Right, Okay. But they would be somebody I think you would like. Yeah, I think you would like. Okay. They got a really interesting style. Nice. Yeah, man. Are you still playing basketball at all? Uh, not really. Um, no. no. I was playing every Monday night. Um, in this league, but I just they played too late at night, so I kind of gave up. I'm in. I'm in bed early, man. Mm, what time? Uh, what time do you usually go? If I had a choice. I'd be in bed by like 8.30. Wow. Yeah. It's like Really? That. Well, because I wake up, I like to try to wake up around 4.45. What? Yeah. Why? Well, because I got to go to the gym before work. Because okay. if you go after work, you're never going to go. Fair. I so, haven't gone yeah. to the gym in like two and a half years. Well, you couldn't tell by looking at you, man. Well, you that's because I don't eat spelt. very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just residuals from my high school days. Yeah, just the carryover. I've literally maintained the mass. It's almost like I'm this giant balloon that you've inflated back when I was in high school and you I was bigger. You just have the leftover mass? But inside, there's nothing. <laughs> and it's just mass. Well, everyone's going for that anyway, so you pulled it off. Yeah, the dad bod, I but think. The, uh, yeah, going to the Anyways, going gym. to the gym. Yeah, which is... Because I, I did try to go after work but it's not gonna happen every gym in the city is gonna be a disaster any gym anywhere is gonna be a zoo it's fair and then no one's let's say someone wants to go for supper there goes your gym day no one's ever asking you out for breakfast at 5 a.m so there's there's no excuse to get out of it that way that's a good point so that's that's how it came to be and then it's just a routine but realistically 8.30 is like the goal, but that's happened like twice. So it's, usually, it's currently 8.15 right yeah, now. <laughs> I'm yawning like a monster. No, it's, I'm usually 10 o'clock to 11 is more realistic. 
10 to 11. That's a far cry. What about 9, 15, 9, 30? They just get skipped over. Like once I make it past eight thirty, I'm like, I'm going, I'm going the whole nine on this one. I'm going like, to eleven o'clock, and the engine light has gone on in the car, and yeah. it's like I'm going my fifty k all the way to see how much this baby's gonna exactly. go. Exactly. You're like, yeah, if it's if you have missed the spot, then you just gotta just go full ham on it. See, I'm the opposite. I hate waking up in the morning. I'm not well, a I don't like it. <laughs> no one likes it. <laughs> I don't know, man. My brother, I don't know if he could do it anymore, but I'm pretty sure he can. The guy can go out till three o'clock in the morning and be up at six, no problem. But it's fucking weird. Could you ever weird. do that? Hmm? Could you ever do that? No. Because like up until probably like three years ago, I could do that. I maybe, maybe when I was nineteen. Because I remember we would go out till about three, and that was when we would all like challenge each other who can make it to church on Sunday. <laughs> So we would always be like, we're all going out, but whoever's not at church on Sunday is <laughs> like, something's going to happen to you. Like, we're going to do something. What and a weird, like, it was well, Because, like, I, I hung out with only Greek people at the yeah, time, right? right? And we I would go out with Greek people. Like, so it would always be that thing where it's like, you just got to be there no matter what. So it was an incentive to do that. And I never missed like I've never missed one of those things. Now I just don't. I barely go in right. just general. And I, but I also don't drink like I used to. But that was the extent. When I was in Calgary, I had a job that I had to work at, and I, I had to be there for six o'clock. But it took me about an hour to walk. Oh, okay. So I had to. I had to be out the door at the latest five ten. Otherwise, I was late. Oh my god. It was God. brutal. Yeah, it's tough. It's fucking brutal. In the summer, it was fine because I'd ride my bike. Okay. And I think I lost like twenty five pounds because my one buddy saw me. He's like, "What the hell happened to you?" And I like, we were broke. Like, me and my roommate were broke, so I was riding my bike every day and maybe eating the equivalent of a pasta salad, like, that you'd get from KFC, like a medium. <laughs> a little tiny bowl. Yeah. Not that specifically, yeah. but that amount of that food in food? that cup the entire day. So, my I, I've taught my stomach to operate um, at, a, at a relatively nothing. high level, like, work my 14, yeah. 15 hours off very little food because we just couldn't have food for it to do it. So, but anyways, I'd have to wake up super early right. to go there. And so at that, that summer, I remember I'd ride my bike every day, barely eat anything. And I was like a rail again. No kidding. Yeah. You, it was really funny. You just get so thinned out so quickly. Oh yeah. And I never crashed, which was funny. Cause that year we went to university. I was talking about our university days yeah, last yeah. week. Um, I was working three jobs and going to, you know, like to university. And I ended up not going to any of my finals cause I slept for like, a week. No kidding. Oh, fuck. That, I will never do that again. Work three jobs or go to university? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe both. Yeah, right? Because they're the on Thursdays were the worst. Sunday, Mondays and Fridays sucked because I was closing down the one place I was working at at 1 o'clock on Sundays and 3 a.m. on Thursdays. And then I had my, on Friday is that psychology we had Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. So then Friday, psych, I was done. By the time I get home, I maybe have like two and a half hours of sleep. I did that for like six months, five, no six kidding. months. Oh, it was brutal. Do you think that, because you always talk about how you, you hated university. Do you think that shaped your hatred for it? Are you? Maybe. Is that part of the reason? Because back was, then I'd say no, but I I think it was more so just, but yeah, back then I'd say no and I hated it because I like I felt like I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. Now, the fact that I'm reading like I read a lot of stuff that we would have been taught, like doing in school. Like mm -hmm. I read statistics, I read economics, I read psychology. And if I had the thirst for knowledge that I have now, then I probably would have loved it. But I can't go back now because I just don't want to because I'm enjoying reading this stuff just on the side as yeah. opposed to like having to take midterms and like because if you, let's say you took these those books that you're reading now that you enjoy, you had them in class, you have to yeah. read them for class, yeah. you probably wouldn't like those books anymore. I don't think so. So there's there's something about uh, independent knowledge or getting knowledge on your own that mm -hmm. I feel like you absorb it a little bit better too. Absolutely you do. Well, how many times have you, like how much better is have you absorbed any type of information that you've actively gone out to go look for? Way more. And exactly. you automatically like are like, uh, you gravitate towards it. You absorb everything. You don't even miss a beat, and you can you can reiterate it to somebody else with a decent level of proficiency. Yeah, because you're when you actually understand what you're talking about, you can put in your own words and put it in your own analogies and put in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're automatically your knowledge and your 
ground for it becomes way better. Well, I, I'm guessing that if we tried having the hip hop conversation or the rap conversation that we had now back then, we wouldn't have the knowledge, the words, or even the patience to I be able to break it. everything down. It's the best. Everyone listens to garbage rap except for me. That's what I'd be <laughs> yeah, saying. That's Every, what would be. That'd be two hours of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then at the end of it, at those two hours, you'd be like, "What did we accomplish? Nothing." But fuck you. That's why <laughs> everyone better listen to my opinion. Yeah. Well, and and that's why now when I think about it, everything I seemingly quote unquote hated back then is just because I was pissed off, tired, and like yeah. felt like I wasn't going anywhere, yeah. and it just ended up being a hindrance to my sleep. That's ultimately what I looked at university, which sucked because I paid for it myself. But at the same time, I didn't like my parents didn't pay for that year or didn't pay for it at like then. Right. I know they helped me when I was going to Calgary because like I was in a different city. So it was like more for like my residence that I had to. So it was school plus residence. And so they helped me pay for my books. But that year I paid for everything myself. So it was just like, eh, it's a bit of a waste of yeah, money. You could harbor some resentment pretty quickly with that sort for of situation. Sure. Yeah, for sure. But again, it was all self-inflicted because I didn't have to work all three of those jobs. Well, if you had to pay for your school, you sort of did. Well, but the thing was, I paid for my school before we got there. True. So true, I had true. the money before that. I just happened to keep going with it. And the, and the beginning, I only had the two jobs, but then the one guy called me up and he's like, hey, remember when you were helping me manage my bar because mm-hmm. it was only the two nights like it wasn't like i was like running this place yeah, i was yeah. just helping him mostly so he can have a couple of days off but he had vlts and the vlts close at like one o'clock on sundays and three o'clock on thursdays right so by the time i dump the machines and count the money put it in the safe and i leave there it's like 4 a.m no kidding yeah right but during the summer who gives a fuck it doesn't matter so why do you think you took on those extra the extra work because the money was good was it just the money oh yeah or do you think it was like this you're trying to prove yourself to yourself that you could do school and do three jobs. Do you think at that time in your life, do you think you were trying to impress yourself? Probably a little in bit in a way and other people. Yeah. And probably set up subconsciously set up some, uh, excuses if it fails. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, I didn't even think about putting it in that perspective. Yeah. I think there's a lot of it too. Like if, if it's, if, cause now I can say, well, what happened to your university thing? Well, I had three jobs too at the same time and whatever. And your thing was like, well, you needed those three jobs to pay for it. But my response now, looking back, and is like, yeah, but I already paid for it yeah, before, I so didn't I didn't actually it. need them. But a lot of it was also like doing favors for the guys that own the, yeah. the restaurant. I mean, there's, there's a different level to that too. But yeah, but there's so many. A lot of it though, because I've been on this kick lately where I blame myself for every bad thing that's ever happened to me, as opposed to blaming other things. And it's a really, it's a mind trip. Okay, tell me, can you think of one example? Oh yeah, when I, well, when I was in, um, when I was. In grade eight, I remember this was a seminal. This is a seminal memory. We were playing basketball against Campbell, and I don't remember. Were you and Campbell in grade eight? Yeah. Okay, so we were playing against you guys. I remember the Kai Williams was on that, everything like that, mm-hmm. and we were actually going to win. I think it was either you guys or another team. Okay. okay? But I specifically remember playing against Campbell once. But anyways, I ended up taking a three that ended up going around the rim and going out. And as it left, that went out, there was still two seconds left on the clock, and we were tied. So what I should have done, and I and I blamed the, the the rim and everything like that, but what I should have done is passed it to Shane McNaughton, who was on my left-hand <laughs> side, because then I he would have been able to at least get the two, get it into overtime, but I wanted to win, because oh. we were tied at that point. I can, But I blame the fact that it wasn't that. I blame the clock. I blame the pressure, like all that other stuff. But I'm like, well, no, it was my fault. I took that shot. And then the other thing was people didn't like me after that. Because you missed? Because I missed, yeah. Yeah. Because up until that point, I was actually like gaining a lot of ground with a lot of people. Like in terms of like I was the new kid in school and I was becoming popular. Right. Which I've never was before. But not like super popular, but enough that people were like. a friend basis and a recognition basis. After that point, oh, dude. (laughs) A bunch of eighth graders just turning their backs to you. (laughs) Dude, it was brutal. You know what happened was I felt so bad for screwing that game up that I ended up. I ended up going on this thing where like I overcompensated for everything that I did, which ends up becoming worse. So like even if I brushed up against you, I'd apologize to you like I like pushed you into the wall. It was fucking weird. So overbearing. Dude, it's so overbearing. And then to the point where it became annoying. And then by the end of the school year, I was fucked. 
Like, I fucked myself. But I blame the fact that everybody took that game so seriously and blah, 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 right? But it's like, well, no. Like, I did a full postmortem on my life since I was five years old based on that principle. And I was like, nope, there was this, 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 how you said this, what you did here, what you did, all of it. And it's been really cool. I've been able to get over a lot of stuff. Okay, because I think if I did that, I can't think of any examples, yeah. seminal memories like that. But if I did that, I would get just right in the trenches and never come out. It's it's it would, really hard. It would just break my gut in half. Well, and the, but the thing is, is that it already happened. Yeah, that's what makes it so hard to get over. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but have you ever done anything like that? Like introspectively, like, you mean? Yeah. Like, like uh, now that you're older, so now that we're talking about, let's say, hip hop in a more, I would say, in a more adult like in a more adult ways, yeah, for instance, I or we're do. talking about these things in, in, in different contexts with perspective and everything like that. Like, did you, you finished university, didn't you? Or, yeah. Yeah. And I then did. did you have any, anything now when you look back, let's say even just from university that like hindered your progress towards any goals after university? Oh, hundred percent. Cause with university, I, I know Anthony actually said this on another episode where he just like, you didn't have to try in school. You yeah. just kind of show up when you got grades. Yeah. And I kind of wanted to just carry that on. Mm-hmm. And so I always found classes that were, seemed easy, mm-hmm. or not easy to a uh, relative, but things that allowed for critical thinking because mm-hmm. critical thinking, it's not, it, there's gray areas. So you're way more likely to get a 75 than you are to get a zero. Right. Um, And so I harbor, I kind of, anchored all my stuff onto classes like that where if i had of just taken a math class i could have got into maybe more fields that i was more interested in instead of getting a bullshit arts degree that does literally nothing so yeah that's my not wanting to actually try at anything I, that that held me back for sure and then like is that something that you carry forward now yeah i keep saying just why don't you try because I keep saying how easy university was for me um, because I made it easy. Mm-hmm. I never put myself in a position where anything was a challenge for me. So, And that was also so many of the things that I wanted to do, they required a class that I didn't want to take. And so I never pursued them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if I had just done that, I probably would have been at least working towards a profession or have some sort of idea of any goals instead of just being an aimless wanderer. So do you consider yourself an aimless wanderer now? Yeah, I think most people are. They yep. don't really realize That's a good it. good point. Because um, you're not... I don't even know how to how to phrase it, but it's... I'm just flying by the seat of my pants, really. Hmm. Like there's... My university gave me literally no foundation for any job. Not that I think jobs are important. I do think they are overrated, but... Un- super necessary but it's they do suck and it's <laughs> sometimes and it's kind of shitty that you have to live your life to work and yeah. work to live your life it's almost like the like it sounded cool at the time but living your life a quarter mile at a time actually sucks yeah it's <laughs> toretto is a fucking idiot <laughs> <laughs> what an asshole <laughs> what an asshole i took your advice and it got me nowhere yeah so it's uh yeah but we're most people are at a job that they got stuck with they're with a husband or wife they got stuck with and not to say that they're bad relationships Mm -hmm. but it's not they're like okay i found this person we get along here's a ring Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that's your position or my position but that's where i feel like we can see a bulk of people it's just things that fell in their lap and they whether it's complacency or contentment i guess that's how you frame in your own mind but that i think that's where a lot of us get put into our our major decisions in our lives yeah you want to um um this book I'm reading by Jordan Peterson, it's uh, called 12 Rules for Life and uh, How to Make Order Out of Chaos or something like that. Okay. So it's essentially like you try to mitigate your chaos. So what you do is you end up establishing a set, a subset of order right. okay. parameters for yourself. And too much order puts you in that level of like you're pretty much coasting. Mm-hmm. Whereas too much chaos, you have no idea what the fuck is going on. Which essentially is your everyday. Like you wake up and you tech, like you can you can guess what's going to happen that day, but for the most part, from the moment you wake up, it's like this endless stream of potential. Like for all you know, you can walk to work, and someone comes up to you that's legitimate that offers you this opportunity of a lifetime, right? So that's the that's the potential that exists 
outside of your world from the moment that you wake up. But what we do, I know I've done before many times, is, well, I moved back to Regina after Calgary where I probably, like, I got a job offer in Victoria. Okay. Um, or Vancouver. I think it was Victoria or Vancouver. But I never took it because Calgary was safe. And that's why I went there for school because I knew people there as opposed to going to like a culinary school in, in Vancouver because I knew it was less expensive. Turns out it was a great school anyways. But I ended up creating these order parameters, but it was under a more chaotic, um, uh, it was more of a chaotic, I guess, ideal, which was like, hey, I'm going to go and do this thing. I have no, no, no idea what's going to happen. Chaos. But I'm going to do it in a place where I know that where there's you know people everything. and this and that. It's 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 relatively inexpensive and I can fit my chaotic ball, roll it down this order highway. Yeah, you're putting your chaos in a bottle so it's yeah. manageable. Yeah. So then do you think that at least since university you've been putting yourself in like a – like I need to make sure that there's order in my life because did university create more chaos or did you just – did you just structure it so it was all just like in between everything's coasting and we're good? That's a. I don't know. That's a. I. I always try to make the hurdles. Sur- able to be surpassed, like it's mm-hmm. so it's, the chaos and the routine, like and the all that sort of stuff was not. Yeah, I guess you could say instead of putting it into a narrow ball, I just made the chaos avoidable or overcomable. Yeah. Like you you staved off whatever could come yeah. in and fuck everything exactly. up, right? But because the thing is, like, and, and that's where I've kind of gotten my, I've done my postmortem on my life when I look back on it and stuff. Because, yeah, like all the stuff that I did was ultimately to try to not, like the intent was to not make things chaotic for me. What's funny is they ultimately made things more chaotic in certain right. cases. Some cases not, but certain cases they, they weren't. Like right now, I left real estate, which is a pretty out like all over the place job, mostly because I didn't like it. Now I've got a job where it's 8 to 4.30. I've got my headphones in all day. Right. It's a job I could have until I'm like ready to retire. And I could probably do the same thing from now until then. And because my finances were so fucked for like six or seven years, right now I'm living in this like bliss where I actually know what's coming in. It's much less than the heyday of real estate. Right. But I've whittled everything down so much that, and and like Soph and I don't do much. Like this is, the, the show is probably the most exciting thing I do on a weekly basis. Right. Right. But I've. I've thrown away everything that could possibly screw up this perfect little moment of content of of contentment but the problem is now i can feel myself being like i need some sh- fucking shit to happen yeah it's weird but i think i think you're that way just thinking about you compared to most people i know is you've tried shit you've yes how many people do we know a even left the city but went on to take a an opportunity to Let's say an adventure, like culinary school is adventurous for lack of a better word. It's out of the norm. It's out of the box. Yeah. And you're talking about your, your rap days and stuff like that. (laughs) How many people do we know that wanted to start a rock band or rap or do spoken word poetry or some shit like that Mm -hmm. and never did because it was too fucking scary. And going into even real estate to a certain extent, starting this podcast, I think is another thing. Like it's you were, you got onto the stuff that everyone's the potential chaos of if we're going down that route is too overwhelming for them to even dip their toes in. Sure. But now you're about to have a kid pretty soon. Right. And that's like, that takes everything that I did and kind of puts it off to the side. Cause it's like, I think this is almost like, like you having a kid right now is making up for all the lack of chaos you had back then to an yes, extent. Yes. Yes. But it, it's a different, it's not a personal chaos to the same sure. extent. Like, there's, Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, the life of KF surrounds me, but to be able to taking on those things that you took on and other people in your shoes, I'm not trying to make it all about you, but like no, they no. take on that, that chaos. There's, there's gotta be something inside of you that's different than a lot of people that mm-hmm. try to minimize it. Well, I mean, 
I get, okay, when you were younger, because like, I've, I've said this before on the show, like when I was younger, my parents were scared of everything. Right. So they didn't let it, let me and my brother really go out too much. My brother had more better opportunities because younger. I paved the way, yeah. you know, the whole older, younger thing. Um, so I think for me, it was the second I was able to break out with my first job. Like, I'm going to break out as far away as I can. Did you ever have something like that? No. I'm boy in a bubble basically the whole time. I've never really done anything risky, never even took any chances. But I mean, like you, you were able to like, you had your friends when you were younger, you guys went out, you guys played basketball at night and all that stuff. Right. Like my experience with something like that, that a person would have when they were like seven, I had like when we would go, like yeah. you, me, Sean, Shane. <laughs> we would literally uh, go Bob, to a playground like, and play. So we literally it's went. Funny yeah. that you put it like that. That was your actual childhood day. <laughs> why do you think it was so important to me, man? Those are like funny. those are that's, huge that's fucking crazy. times for me. I thought you just liked having fun. Well, I did, but like it was almost like, and it's funny because yeah, like we were. I think I was still working at A and W with the boys. Were we in high school then, or was it after high school? I almost want to say it was after high it was school. After it must have, it was probably our our. What do they call that? A year. year after. Yeah, the year. we Because we both took a year off right after. Yes. Because you, me, and Sean were all in university together. Yeah. And because we'd all taken a year off and all yeah. started at the same time. So that year off that we took. Yeah. So we were, we were too old to be so playing fun. games on a playground. But Dude, that was so was great. Every night. Like, Which playground tonight? Yeah. Yeah. Because we were playing uh, Womp Ball. Womp Ball was a great invention. But we played Foursquare for a bit and we did Grounders for a bit. Yeah, but Womp Ball came out of Foursquare. Yeah. Because it was just giant Foursquare on a tennis court. Yeah. And then we played basketball. One ball is a sport that we created. Yeah. Just so everyone knows. And yeah. I was this close because my mom was a teacher. I was this close to making a proposal. And by this close, I mean I don't take on any chaos that we discussed. <laughs> but as coming up with a proposal to see if we could put it into like school curriculum. How awesome would it be? It'd be great. We'd be legends. We, I think we are legends. <laughs> and our but we'd be mind. even bigger legends. I, I wanted us to go back and play one ball and just realize how... F- awful it probably is it you know just... i saw sean because he's like the one that doesn't live here anymore right. right like he recently got married by the way um which is cool last time i saw sean was before i moved to calgary at least like when he was still living in regina i saw him last year last year or the year before it was so crazy i hadn't seen him for the longest time yeah. and he was like walking across the school here and it like fucking blew my mind but it was so weird because i don't know it didn't feel the same and it's and, and it was kind of it's it was super depressing because I was just like fuck we used to like hang out all the time. And it's like an ex girlfriend that didn't break your heart. Pardon? It's like an ex girlfriend that didn't like yeah. You don't have, like oh yeah, we used to be a lot and yeah. we're nothing. But it's different with a friend because there's no falling out. Uh, no, there's no there's no there fight. Was, there's there just was separation. No falling out. There was nothing. We just like it. Just uh, we went different paths, right? But it's weird because with you and Shane, for instance. It's like I can I can message Shane messaged me the other day and it was like nothing changed. Mm-hmm. Right. And then like even with you, when you messaged me like to go show houses, like going show, to show see houses with you was kind of like almost the equivalent of just hanging out when we yeah, were younger. A lot, a lot similar. for sure. At least I tried to make it that way because I felt that way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's so strange when when I look back at like all those moments where it's like where we did hang out after university before university sorry yeah after high school after high school before university that one year because it was like making up for all that time where I'm imagining you had that when you were yeah a little yeah for you it was making up for us it was reliving it yeah yeah and it's super yeah it was super interesting to 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 experience or it's it was super interesting for me when I went back to think about it that way right You know, like I almost felt like Jack (laughs) in a way, except I didn't have this like degenerative disease that made me grow to be like a 50 year old man at the age of 12. And yeah, hairy knuckles when you're in fifth grade. And my super hairy knuckles. I think I still had hairy knuckles. Yeah, you are I was a hairy fucking guy. Yeah. I do recall. But it was weird. So like, does the fact that everything, have you ever done a postmortem on your life? At least on certain moments where you're like you're just sitting there like at work or something and just thinking about it. Like that's when I do mine. And you're just kind of like thinking about stuff in the past and like how you could kind of retroactively fix everything. Um, not not in a structured sense. You just yeah. have this memory. A memory will come to you like an interaction you had with a person of significance or not. Mm-hmm. And like if I had to handle that 
with my brain now. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, when you leave a fight, it's like, oh, I could have thought of the perfect thing to say. And you think yes. about it after. It's not even like that. It's like the, I have a better knowledge base. I have a better sense of self that I could react. To. Like, I, I kind of wish I could go back to high school with the, my sense of self that I have now. Oh, if that's when a, that's someone a, that's made fun of my pimples, I'd be like, I'd be laughing with them. Yeah. Instead of crying in my pillow all damn night because oh, someone God. didn't like my damn zits. My first memory here, they had this like big Greek party at the church. I think it was like New Year's Eve or something like that. And then there's this one dance where one person goes in the middle and dances it by themselves. Traditionally, it's a drunken man's dance. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've evolved it to something else. But I remember dancing it and. This is how I picture it in my mind. It may be because I've seen too many movies, but you know in those movies where like the camera pans around really, really fast and it shows all the people laughing at yeah, the yeah, kid yeah. or the person? That's all I pictured happening was people laughing at me as opposed to smiling at the fact that I'm doing this as a right. young kid. And then I see my dad's face and I don't remember if he was smiling or not. All I remember is beelining it to the bathroom and crying like a little <laughs> bitch. And then peep, and I remember my dad telling me the story. Everyone thought that he had said something to me and got me upset. For dancing right. that dance or whatever. I didn't dance that fucking thing for like 15 years <laughs> after. This is terrified of it. Then, after that 15 years, I never stopped dancing that fucking thing. Is that, and it was so weird. Is that part of your rebuilding yourself? No, that was way before I even like had the yeah. notions of anything. But I think that went to like all of that stuff was I just jam-packed everything. Because I like thought like I had experienced nothing. Because of the overbearing nature of my parents, even though, like, to this day, I honestly, for the way that they raised me and my brother, wouldn't have changed a fucking thing. No. Because I'm like, the way that I react to things, naturally, even things that I'm volunteering for, I tend to go a little bit over. So, the fact that they instilled more of a boundary there. Right. Like, I I don't know if you've ever done, like, hard drugs before. But I've done MDMA before, and I fucking loved it. Okay. It was unbelievable, (laughs) okay? It was one of the best things I've ever had in my life. Thank fuck that I'm so scared of my own finances and, like, being, like, broke. Right. Otherwise, I probably would have been an addict of all kinds because I have an addictive personality. Yeah. I got onto smoking. Like I'm still like I'm still kind of smoking, but not nearly as much as I used yeah, to. Yeah, because you're talking about getting the vape the other day. I did. Like, yeah. yeah, I got it. It's still okay. I use it just for work now, but like, so I'm I'm trying to cut both of them at the same time. So it's been going good, but I have an addictive personality. Yeah. But my fear of wasting my money and being disowned by my parents because of it superseded my wanting. For that drug or that alcohol. <laughs> it was fucking weird. Just right before you would buy some MDMA, just your parents' faces coming to your head? Oh, man. No, because all the times I did it, I'm like, fuck it, let's do it. But it was yeah. free. I yeah, never had yeah, to yeah. buy it. it was, oh, no, sorry. The one time we bought it. We almost got arrested in LA with it. It's, we almost got fucked. Yeah. That's a, that really brings that story to a terrible ending if it happens that way. Oh, man. It was crazy. That whole, mo- that whole like 20-minute moment was like the craziest thing. But anyways... Because I'm an excessive individual by nature, maybe because of or as a consequence of my parents' overbearing nature, or because I'm just naturally like that. That's just been embedded in me since the beginning because I was a pretty rowdy kid. Like I just like wasn't like the best five-year-old kid in the world. So I think all of those things culminated to like the perfect storm of how I was raised and then how my natural nature is. Did you have anything like that? Like when you look at your own nature and how you were raised and how you kind of adapted things going forward, were there things like that that you think of now that like, wow, this actually counterbalanced the other thing? Even if you found that university, you made university the way that you wanted to, which you you got, you, like you paid for it. Yeah. Like it was paid for. So you almost might as well have in a way. But do you ever see it? Like, have you ever thought of up until now, even parts of it where you're kind of parsing it out and looking at it from different angles. I don't think I'm as goddamn deep as you are. Just hearing you talk about your life is mesmerizing. Oh, but it's, uh, it's, it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. I'm trying to think of because my parents were, I want to say overbearing, mm-hmm. but they, I was the youngest. 
So that came yeah. with two things. So like, like you said, your younger brother had a little bit more freedom because you paid. So I had a lot more freedom. Yeah. But I also had being treated like a baby. Mm -hmm. So not wanting me to get hurt, whether it's physically or emotionally. So I think there was always some barriers set up to protect me from those kind of things that as I got older, I didn't notice that they were there. So I never like, a, if I was in an uncomfortable social situation, my parents would maybe pull me out. So now if I'm in an uncomfortable social position, I will pull myself out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think I ever got over that to the same extent. Okay. I think I'm, I'm, I'm ru rutted in what my parents created of me. I'm their monster. Well, yeah, but most of them, most of us are. Like yeah. I said, there's like, there's so many things now where I probably could have done more if I didn't have that thing of like, I almost feel like I have to ask permission to do things. Okay. On everything. It's really weird. And I've just recently noticed it in the past two years where it's like, I feel like I have to. Um, I have to get somebody else to give me the go ahead for shit. Even down, like when I go shopping for clothes, I bring soap with me. A her ta her taste is outstanding, impeccable. Because she's bought clothes for me on her own that I'm like, that's great. Yeah, how did you pull this off? Yeah, how did you do this? But like, she's awesome, right? So, but even down to that, it's weird. Because, yeah, because my thing the the barrier thing that I had is that now. If there's a goal that I want to accomplish mm -hmm. and there's steps A, B, C, and D, and B is something that I don't want to do, I'm never going to get to that end goal. Mm -hmm. And yeah, those barriers, I'm wondering, oh man, you're making me, you're like a psychologist now. I'm just, Sorry. I'm, I'm sitting backwards on a coach. And it's, yeah, it's <laughs> that they, those barriers came stopping me from doing. So like literally something as simple as making a phone call to someone I don't want to call. Like Crazy, let's say there's a, the yeah. job opportunity that I want. Yeah, but I got to call Linda and talk to her for not, not going to happen. Yeah. So, oh yeah. yeah. I've done that tons. I've done that tons, especially when it comes to like old friends, because the funny thing is there's this weird thing that I either feel like I am a burden Holy and that shit, you're, now you're singing my chorus. Yeah. Like I, I naturally feel like I'm a burden to people. Yeah. Like for the most part. So even if it's a person that's like, yeah, call me tomorrow, I'd still feel like I'm inconveniencing mm -hmm. them because unless I call at the actual perfect time, which I have no, like, there's no way. It's for a made-up perfect what, time. Yeah, it's this, it's this perfect time I've put up in my mind where it's like, okay, if I call them now, looking at the time, what might they be doing, so on yeah. and so forth, that it's just going to ruin everything. Like, I, there was this girl that I was seeing. Turns out I wasn't seeing her at all. She was just like, <laughs> like to hang out with me okay. and maybe kiss me every once in a while. But like, unless the day went perfect, it was fucking weird. Unless the day went absolutely flawless and I didn't do anything remotely bad. This is what got into my head. Then she would hang out with me. But if one thing went wrong for some reason, she wouldn't hang out with me. But turns out she was like doing this with me and like four other people. Okay. Right. But in your head, you were in creating head, her. Yeah. Like that, Fuck. that the whole, like everything had to be absolutely perfect. And I was young at the time. And this is when I was, was first going out because yeah. like, you know, first experiences after my first girlfriend, because my first girlfriend was in grade 12, but it was, it was, it was crazy. Like having to, having to deal with the fact or still having to try to deal with the fact that no, like I can call this person. Like I'm not actually a burden because A, I didn't do anything to them and there's no reason for me not to message them. Like Sean, for instance, because I've been thinking about Sean for some reason a lot because I was like I'm trying to like bring my circle back right. kind of thing, right? And it's like, I want to message the dude. Like I, I, I want to be like, dude, what's going on? I haven't. No, I have I wanted with... to congratulate him on my wedding. On his wedding, sorry, <laughs> on my wedding. <laughs> hey, dude, congratulations <laughs> on me getting married. No, I wanted to send him a message on uh, on his wedding. But then I was like, well, he never messaged me on my wedding, so... You know, I'm off the hook on that one, even though it's fucking stupid. Yeah, I, there's so many people I just want to be like, oh, hey, how's it going? Or I remember this time. Like, I just, I want to. And I'm like, it's funny. It's it's like as my day progresses, mm -hmm. the more I get in my own head. So I'll wake up at, let's say, 4.30 a.m., whatever, 5 a.m. And like, you know what? I'm going to message this person this day. Mm -hmm. And then I don't. Mm -hmm. And like, well, that'd be so, imagine just 
that'd be so weird for that person. Oh, you're going to annoy them. And then you just start, you start building into your own like weird self. Yeah. It's, it's super strange. And like, for the most part, it's like when I get messages from people, I think it's the best thing ever. Like I'm super excited to get messages from people. I don't think aside from overbearing clients, like back in the day, yeah, yeah. and we're talking the ones that would message me like 12 times a day. I never was like, I always pick up my phone. Like it's always there now. Maybe not so much cause I'm at work, right. but like I could still pick up my phone at work. Um, but if there's like a text coming through or a message or an email or whatever, like I'm on it like that. Mostly because I like to respond to people right away. But another thing is like, I'm actually excited to get one. Even if someone, I haven't heard from somebody in like 15 years, it's like the opposite effect, but it's weird because it's almost like the same thing of what I did after I missed that shot in school where it's like, I overcompensated for the, my, for the fact that I lost that game for the team as opposed to sh- passing it to that team. Yeah. And so everything I did after was trying to make up for that so that I was that dude that had to make up for it for with everybody. It's strange. Yeah. It's very, very strange. That's, uh, I like how you connect to those two things, too. Well, I tried. I tried. Yeah. I'm big on connection. Do you think that, like, so for your son now, are you going to try to look at doing it differently? Like, are you, like, are there stuff that you're looking at or thinking about, which, I mean, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but when you're thinking about like, Hey, what are the things that I remember my parents did? And what are the things I'm going to take from it? And what are the things I'm just going to leave behind? Yeah. The only way, the only thing I can think of is how they talked. Mm, mm, Let's say you had to do a chore. Mm -hmm. One parent would say something in a way that you just wanted to burn the fucking house down. (laughs) Don't talk to me that way. You condescending parent and another parent would say something like i really don't want to okay i guess i have to i want to see what the wording is or what the tone is or what the maybe just the body positioning and posture is that as a kid you didn't react so internally violent because did you did you have a parent that when they said let's say they said the exact same thing and one parent you wanted to knock their teeth out and the Mm -hmm. other one if it was something you didn't like you're like you're okay but you you still felt you were gonna do it Oh, for sure. Well, I was scared shitless on my dad, so yeah. that was automatic. Like, no, whatever my dad said, it's like, <laughs> soldier at the ready, sir, even yes, though I sir. hated it, right? Whereas my mom, I like I've said this before, like, I feel so bad for my mom because me and my brother were such shitheads. And, like, she went through the ringer with us, and it was weird because, like, the second she would invoke my dad's name, be like, I'm going to tell your dad, we fucking froze. Yeah. Game over. Were you there at Sean's house? When I had drank that vodka. I don't know, but I want to hear more about this. We were at Sean's house, and I, I want to say you were there, because it was a, uh, we were 15 years old, I think. Okay. I forget whose birthday. It might have been right was. before my time. Was like, it? Like, hanging out with you guys. Maybe. We were playing Roll Call. Yeah, that wouldn't have been me. Okay. Yeah, if they were here, fuck, it was so funny. We were playing Roll Call, and Roll Call says a specific, a certain word, a lot. And I drank half a thing of vodka and I got super wasted. Anyways, my dad comes to pick me up because for some reason, being super fucking wasted, I still remember to call my dad. Okay. <laughs> and Sean, it was Sean, Shane, and Corey. That's who it was. They stand me up at the front door and they were scared shitless of my dad. No kidding. They open the door enough that I that could push me through and my dad can catch me on the other side. <laughs> and and the they, right fucking, they vanished. No, they left the door open. <laughs> I'm like dead weight right into my dad and he took me home and i was like fucked right those guys bolted straight down the stairs it was so funny that's it but anyways super terrifying no but like mostly because of his look because him and i are almost identical in a lot of ways because like he's super emotional and i'm super emotional whereas my brother and my mom are like straight faced do you have a look then like could you invoke fear in anyone in your family if you had a look i don't think so no no i once told my brother i'd disown him once yeah. Yeah, I gave him the I gave him the speech of I forget what it was. It was so long ago, but this was back when me and him were just like haven't figured out how to like coexist because when I lived in Calgary everything was great. Right. Cuz he can come visit, it was a party, right? Everything was good. But then when I came back, I came back a different person. And it was a person that wasn't fitting into any of the molds that were going on. So it was a it was a very interesting troubling time for me. But anyways, 
I forget what had happened, and I don't even think he was 100% in the wrong, but I fucking went off. But it was over the phone, so it wasn't the same thing. Long story short, he ended up doing the thing that I reamed him out for, or that I was going to disown him if he didn't do. Okay. But I don't know if that was because of anything other than him just being like, fuck it, I'll just do it. Just or do it again. because I actually invoked any fear. I don't think I have the capability of invoking fear. No. I feel I like that's so. something that's lost on people our age in general. Maybe. Like, I don't see anyone my age that I could see them intimidating a kid or a peer or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm t- I kept trying to think, I, I keep trying to think of somebody, but like, not to that extent. No. Maybe this, kind of like, I don't want to get chewed out. That's fine. But, yeah. you know. There's a list, because you always hear these stories about the dad look or the dad voice. Mm-hmm. Like, the dad can say one word and everyone quiets down. I think your dad was this pretty representative of that. But it's, For sure. I don't, I couldn't even imagine, especially with my high pitched voice. I can't be terrifying with this thing. Yeah, but I think what you have on your side is the fact that you're unassuming. Yeah. So I don't remember if I've ever seen you freak out. Like no. I'm trying to think back. I don't think you've ever actually like went off on somebody. So I think because you're very unassuming. Like if you and I stood next to each other and they looked at me with more like with darker features, where you have more lighter features, they would say like, "Oh, that dude's like." a mean son of a gun or whatever. And they would expect me to be right. maybe more aggressive. Whereas for you, you're unassuming, dude. You've got to flip it on. Him. Yeah. Like I think if, I think if I was ever on the other side of like you getting legitimately mad, cause I think everybody has the cap- Like if you're legitimately mad, there's nothing that'll stop you. Mm-hmm. But you it, like, you have to get to that point, right? Like I, 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 I know of a bunch of stuff that gets me to that point. But I don't know if it's like actually me being angry or me wanting to show that I'm angry. But like, I think if you did it, it would be a really bad day for that person. Because yeah, I only have I have three levels. I have mm-hmm. zero, which is ninety percent of the time. Mm-hmm. I have like a three, where you're just frustrated because life sucks and you're sick of being chill about it. Mm-hmm. And that's like maybe nine point nine percent of the time. And then I have a twelve. Oh, where I will shake buildings. I don't know how I get there. But it's straight blackout. Like, I was at a party one time, and it was at a place I was renting. This girl I didn't know was being drunk and annoying. Everyone was drunk, but they were next level drunk, Mm -hmm. and they're just annoying. And they insulted one of my friends, and snap, don't know what happened, just fucking lost it on them, and kicked this girl out of my house, which probably doesn't make me seem too super, super tough, but yeah, just get her out of my house. And then I come back inside and I'm back to zero. And all my friends are just looking at me like eyes wide open. Like who the fuck is this guy? And well, like I mean, no one talked to me for like an hour Yeah, and I couldn't figure out why. And it's yeah. just like, it was, it's almost like an out of body experience when I get mad. It's that unassuming nature, dude. So watch and, out and if kicking, I get to a 12. Well, and kicking somebody out of your house, let's say, and the fact that like, you don't know to what extent it was like, Somebody watching it from the outside, like to see you, someone who's very, like I said, unassuming. Yeah. Usually, like, you know, you're smiling, you're laughing, you're pretty chill. Like, you're at that three level, let's mm-hmm. say, right? Or even a zero. To go to that point, it's like something would have happened. Yeah. Whereas for me, like, I jump across that spectrum so many yeah, times. Yeah, back and forth all the time. Mm-hmm. I get frustrated very easily. If you listen to like some of our earlier episodes, there's a lot of times where I'd go off on Anthony. It's really bad. How come? What, tri- um, what did he do that triggered you? I think a lot of it was, I know there was one infamous Lion King episode where we were talking about the trailer. And I think I had said that I was going to punch him in the face. Okay. Yeah. I'm and to- I was like, and every time I think about that, I'm like, that's one of my biggest blunders on this like whole entire podcast run. Why? Is because A, I was wrong. And B, I thought I was so right that I was willing to lie because I said I, I think I said there that I watched The Lion King like ten times a year. <laughs> yeah, I watched you it. Said he watched it a ton. I yeah, can't remember I watch it five times a year. Okay, that's actually <laughs> that's, not a lot when you think about it. That's still a ton, man. I love that movie, man. <laughs> I know. So I haven't seen any movie five times. Little oh, little. seriously? Like I think I watched Below for the third time this year, and it's. September, so I'll probably watch it a couple more times. A couple more times. I've yeah. already seen God, or I've already seen Goodfellas six times this where, year. Where do you find the time? I'm going to bed at eight thirty. I don't have time for these. Well, movies. and a lot of it is because I watch the TV when I go to bed. Mm-hmm. So I put a lot of these movies on, and I watch like 
parts of them because yeah, yeah. I've already seen them, so I don't actually have. You're to not watch as them. consumed by them. But the tough part is like when I would uh, when I'd be going to sleep at like eleven o'clock, I'll go to sleep at eleven thirty because there would be a part on them like, oh, I want to watch. Yeah, this I've got to finish that part. So, but anyways, it was a lot of really hard stuff. But that was a the show itself was getting to me. And I needed to prove myself as a host. I thought either to myself or to the audience. So I came up with this figure of 10 or 15 or 20 times watching The Lion King to try to win over Anthony for some reason because I thought he was wrong because he's been wrong in the past. It was super weird. It was super naive. So you you embellished that number on purpose. At the it time, wasn't just I like thought a slip? it was because I say I, I think stuff it was, like that all the time by accident. I think subconsciously it was on purpose. Yeah, because I think subconsciously I wanted to be like you're fucking. I know idiot the ins right and outs of this. You're yeah, yeah, and so and and I think I sabotage myself subconsciously just so I can reflect on it now and being like that you cannot do anymore. There's so, a, but there's a human element to that. Yeah, um, of course. There's as a, well, a, as yeah. a listener, first and like a recent listener, I I've listened to that episode but they all kind of blend together because yeah there's kind of a lot been, but like the as a listener when the host or whoever has that moment of humanity even if it's a shitty thing well, mm. unless you're like being outwardly offensive but when you're like openly mad at another host or guest there's something that can be endearing about that too well i know anthony and i've always had like a comp like not a competition but there's always been tension with us because whereas nick is like he's straight Mm-hmm. Like there's very few things I've seen Nick get mad and it's a wonderful thing, <laughs> but Nick's one of those guys that like, you don't want to get Nick mad because he doesn't black out. He actually gets more laser focused and I've seen him verbally tear down people to the point of them. Yeah. Be, like not even existing anymore. So Nick's a scary guy to like, you don't want to piss him off. Yeah, I don't, I don't know him super well, but I can yeah. imagine him just saying something that makes me want to not, not go outside. Yeah. My brother, from what I remember as kids, he's more physical, but I haven't seen him get super, super mad, but he is more composed, angry than I am. Right. That's what I would put. So then Anthony, Anthony and I have always had this like thing where we would like, it always be a thing where him and I would like argue about something random. Right. And then there, for some reason, I just, you know what it is? I'll put it this way. Have you ever taken ownership on something you haven't, you have no claim on? but you feel like it's a part of you, like a song or a yep. this or that. And if someone bashes it, like fuck that other person. Mm-hmm. Or if someone claims to know more of it than you do, not even necessarily bashes it. Right. And I think there was one of those moments. Cause like the Lion King has been like a Your big thing. deal for me since I was a kid. Yeah. You watch it 30 times a year here, <laughs> dude, 150 <laughs> times a year. Like I don't think that's possible, but like watching it that many times, and like still choking up when I see it, like you feel like it's yours in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've dropped that for a lot of stuff now. Like, especially when people like criticize things that like I care for. It's like, that's cool. Like, it yeah, just, that's, but it I, doesn't affect me. Like, it, it shouldn't, it's not me. No, like, it's not. I didn't make this. I just like this. I just really like this. And it also doesn't define me. Like, me liking this thing doesn't make up my whole entire world. No. But I think in those pockets, your world gets condensed to the very thing that's being criticized. It's really weird. Well, it's like, I mean, when you make fun of a sibling mm-hmm. and then someone else says the exact same thing to a sibling that isn't, no, uh that's not yeah. how this works, man. Yeah, fuck that person. Yeah. So yeah, it's, there's a, there is that, I can see the, the pride that you have in liking this thing just kind of mm. taking over. Well, and again, a lot of it was me trying to prove myself as a host on the yeah. show because like I've always found that I'm the weakest link of the show since the figure? very beginning. Oh man. Well, now we're doing a real deep. I got to unravel this here. Oh no, no, no. Like I have already said, like, I think yeah. I've said this before. I know you talked. I've about always thought like the show was super weak and it wasn't where like now it's where I want to be. You guys were about this in the last episode a little bit. Yeah. With Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. Like on our deep dive. Yeah. So like, but because of that, I've always tried to be like. I didn't realize that until after that particular episode. Then, because that particular episode, I was the weakest person in the episode. And it's usually when you're at your like lowest point, or at least you feel like you're at one of your lower points. Not from a creative perspective, but I think from an overall how you perceive yourself. 
Okay. And so perceiving yourself, I think, is one of the bigger things. Like, are you going to, in this book I'm reading, it talks like the very first chapter is like, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Because a lot of us don't do that. So I try to do that more and more. And a lot of this stuff, like if I would have discovered before that episode, I probably wouldn't have reacted that same way. Okay. You know? And like, I don't know if you've experienced anything like that where you look at, like in your life where you look at it as like the, what I've, what I encapsulated there actually was the pivoting point between who I was and who I am now. I like that. There, I know there's moments for that for me. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I could pinpoint them, but there's certain air times when you do something and you think about that and you just shift everything. Like I, mm-hmm. it, the way I, and I think with, but going back to music, there's a certain point where probably someone said something about someone that I liked, like a, a song that I liked or an artist that I liked. And instead of reacting like you want to punch them in the face or having done that in the past, you go back and you're like, wait, what do I give a shit? Mm-hmm. And then, so then it does kind of change you as a, a person. You you can think. And then from then on out, I've never had that attachment to something that has made me react that way. So to speak. Yeah. It's like, it's interesting. Cause you get like, you do get attached to a lot of stuff. Like, and, and I think it depends on like, I got attached to, um, I get attached to things very quickly because I put a lot of value in a lot of things. Like, and that's not to say that I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like this great guy that puts value in everything. But like my interactions with people, let's say, I put a lot of value in. Like if I saw you once and we had a five minute interaction, like you're actually an important person in my life. So when I see you, I'm actually excited to see you. It's not just some throwaway thing. Okay. Where I know that some people like, especially if they meet a lot of people or if they've been popular their whole lives or if they're busy or whatever it is, they don't see it the same way. So I value, like I feel, and this isn't, this isn't the case. This is just how I feel. I feel like I value my friendships more than my friends value my friendship to them. Now, do you think that's, it makes perfect sense. Now, do you think there's any level of like, personal insecurity and that's why 100 yeah. percent. there's the fact that i didn't have those friendships when yeah. i was younger so there's again it's all that catching up stuff yeah i have i have a few friends now that they they may not have had friends or may not have had the most stable family life mm. and hanging out on a friday watching tv mm-hmm. like they're trying to contain themselves from like talking about it for the next three days and what how much it meant like it's it's yeah there's about certain people that didn't have it or are reshaping it, they they value it in such a way that makes them endearing to people. So the people that you talk to, they probably find a value they don't normally find because they can share your energy. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what it is. It's like it's like a, an exchange of energy yeah. between two people. But again, that for me, I feel that the energy on my side is too much. Like I'm willing to go into things with people. Like for instance, for you, like. When's the last time we actually talked to each other outside of when you messaged me? Over a year ago. Over a year ago, right? Yeah. But like that would not hold me back from going in like as deep as you possibly can with somebody. And having this conversation or yeah. a conversation like this. Like if we were just hanging out and having this conversation. Like there's a lot of people that I don't think I could do that with after not talking to for like a week. Well, you Let alone a year, let alone. Yeah. You probably didn't think that was going to happen today either. Well... I thought you had some magic you'd bring out of me. No, man. Like, I literally had no idea how this was going to go. No, I, I don't think there's really a, a foreground for it, but yeah, it's fun. It's, I got to say, it's fun seeing this in person. Your voice, so much gravitas to it. <laughs> and you're you're thinking a step ahead of everything. Well, I, I'm thinking a step ahead of things now. Yeah. But mostly because these deep dives are actually like the slow motion version. Okay. Where you just let, it is, it is just that, it's just a conversation. Yeah, but I can say something stupid, which I have, yeah. and you you fucking turn it into something every time. Well, that's, it's, it's that's fun hard. To wa- it's fun to watch it happen. <laughs> yeah, it, it. But the thing is, that's because I've I've actually learned, especially through with Soph, like ever since I've started, actually, like you know, since not since we've been engaged, because I've, I've we've been together before the show started, for instance. Mm. But because of the show and Soph, I've actually been trying to slow down my rate of thinking. 
to go as far as the person is speaking to me. If that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. So like, yeah. So if, 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 if we're going to put it on a scale of one to 10, the person starts and stops their conversation at a six. I'm not thinking at 10, I'll stop at six right? and slow down the whole thing at least to try. So that way I can, I'm actually listening. Cause I think for a real long time I haven't, I wasn't listening. You're and trying so, to think of your next thing to say. Yeah. Whereas, and, and it might have come across as more artificial or more forced right. or planned, for instance. Okay, yeah. Whereas now, at least I try to, I, I try to slow it down to the extent that I'm following exactly what the person's saying. Because if I was, if I had dropped off at any point, it's because I wasn't paying attention to what you were saying, and it, it wouldn't have been relevant to what you were talking about, anyways. Because right. I've done that before. And a lot of it is just speed and frequency because I've done this a couple more times. Yeah, there's definitely some... You can tell there's a skill that you've acquired from doing this. I think so. The I problem imagine. is I just never have it structured. It just goes, which I think works better. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it depends. Like, it's... The structure's there if it falls apart. Yes. So if we had a lull that you weren't able to come up with something. I don't know how you pull these things off, honestly, but if there's a law we didn't have. And you're like, Hey, well, let's talk about this. Like at least that gives you an out. But other than that, like the free flowing, that's, that's all the best. I'm assuming all the, your favorite podcasts are kind of like that. I enjoy. Yeah. Especially now, especially when we talked about it with Anthony last week, where like he was saying, like he's enjoying the way the show is in general, because mm-hmm. we don't have the live show going on. But even these ones are my favorite ones because these are the ones that I can actually just have a conversation with the other person. The thing I try to make sure, and I don't know if I accomplish it every time, is I try not to hijack the conversation because I'm really here to facilitate the guest. So this is where on playback, where I can listen to it, and and this is where I try to tweak it. Okay. Now, I know that you had no idea what was going to happen today, and neither did I. So who knows how much of a give and take it is, but I try to make it at least at the very minimum 60, 40. This one might've been more 50, 50. You think I ho- so? I hope so. I'm thinking it's like 90, 10 for, for you. I think you were, you were steering the whole ship. No, 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 not steering, but I'm saying talking. Yeah. I still think that was yeah, so in a good way a, though. I hope so because that might be a problem. That's no, where no, no. it might be an issue that, because this is, what, is about this is about my deep dive with my guest. Yeah, well, my guest is the main show, right? Yeah. Okay. I guess in terms of the actual speaking time, maybe, but yeah, there, your ability to steer without overwhelming the conversation is pretty cool. Well, that's good because we happen to go from a giant hornet in Victoria to this. Yeah, that's <laughs> I was just like mid conversation. Sometimes I'd be like, "Fuck, we're really doing like we're just we're just going with it," and yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, man. It's fun. It's not that, like, again, this morning I was like super, I'm nobody's nervous though. Like no matter what, yeah. every week I'm nervous. Like this was nervous. Like I was like at work today and I was like, fuck, what the fuck is it going to be like? No matter what, I'm always nervous. And then just like, sometimes you just kind of flow into it. Yeah. I was very excited, but also extremely nervous. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, the whole past week I've just been like trying to think of things to say. I don't think I touched on a single one of them, but it's just good. It's probably better that way because it would have came off as stupid. How many sneakers do you still have? Do you have right now? How many sneakers do I have? Oh boy. Uh, I'd like to say 250. You're at 250 sneakers right now. Maybe. Where are these? So my, well, I always have a room for them. And in my new house, I got my own, like there's a spare bedroom in the basement and it's got a walk-in closet. That walk-in closet is now the shoe room. Damn. Yeah. So I don't know if it's quite like I do. I try to at least seasonally, although it's probably less than that give some away like I, I don't really sell them that's a whole different side of sneaker collecting that i am very much against but i do try to donate them as much as i can but it's i there's something about quality is cool but there's something fun about having quantity like mm-hmm. if i said i have 10 really cool pairs of shoes mm-hmm. no one's really gonna give a shit when i say 250 people lose their mind so I, and there's something yeah. intoxicating about making when people react that way whether i feel stupid about it but there's still something kind of intoxicating about it Hey man, I know people that collect stuff hardcore that yeah. have no, like they will do nothing but just have them there. Yeah. So, out of these two hundred and fifty, how many do you actually wear on rotation? On well, it depends. So I try. There's only one pair of shoes that I own that hasn't been worn. 
Oh, shit. All. I make sure I try to wear all of them. Again, for those that care about shoes, there's there's kind of two. There's people that wear them and people that keep them in their box fresh, never touch. There's two kind of collectors, and I always try to be the one that wears them. Um, but in constant rotation, like, I don't know. Because I can, on a good day, I'll wear, like, eight different pairs of shoes in a day. Eight in a day? Like, so I'll, let's say... I wake up and I go to the gym. So I'll go to the gym in a pair of shoes. Okay. Now I'll change into my gym shoes and then we'll go to the mall, something like that. I'll wear a different pair of shoes. We'll come home. We'll go for dinner. We'll wear a pair of shoes. We come home and then we'll go with friends and a different pair of shoes. Our, our, so that's a ton of shoes just right there. Like maybe eight was an overstatement, but I wear, I'll that's wear, still, like, that's I'll wear at least a handful today. in a day, any day. Like for today, example, I will wear like three different pairs of shoes and I've just been to here and work. That's crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. I don't think I have anything like that. So any, like, do you stick to a particular brand or is it whatever, whatever you like, whatever's cool and whatever is like unique? Cause I know you've always had just, they, they haven't, they've been shoes that have always just been unique if nothing else. Yeah. I've, I was always very trying to branch out and I don't mean like branch out into brands you never really heard of. I only have probably a few pairs of shoes that, from brands that people never heard of, but I do try to, when everyone was getting Nikes and Jordans, I was getting old Reeboks and Adidas and stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. everyone's kind of on Adidas now and I'm kind of getting classic Asics and Nike runners and stuff like that. So, um, always been off it like that, but yeah, there, my collection is going to be predominantly Nike and Jordan still. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then kind of like old school Reebok would probably be third. Have you been, uh, I don't know if you can track this. Have you been tracking them? Like, do you have like a log of where, like what year the shoes are from? Mm, when I was probably five years ago, I was very much more into it. Kind of like with you and not doing hard drugs. It, <laughs> needing money to live yeah. took over my obsession with shoes. And it was an obsession. Like not, it's to the point now where it's like a fun thing, but there's, I'd stay awake and I'd go through eBay and I'd go through Instagram and I'd go through oh, all the yeah. different sneaker blogs, just trying to find a, and so I could have this, yeah, I was, I was obsessed with it, but um, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, no, I just I I just collect them and I wear them and yeah. Oh, in terms of what year? Yeah, I don't keep track of the years so well. Yeah, that's- Not, I used to because like, oh yeah, these Jordans are from 2011. Oh, I got the 2014 release because that's a big thing because every year release has a different amount of credibility to it. Have you been at least taking a look? Like you may not sell them for like you're probably not going to sell them, but or you may not be thinking right now that you're going to sell them or whatever. Do you know how much the value, like yeah. what your rarest shoe is? Yeah, I get, I get that a lot. Um, when I talk to people about it and then shoes are funny cause they're, they're kind of like vehicles that the second you take them off the lot, they lose half their value. So a pair of shoes, something that you could get readily in a city like Regina, let's say it costs 200 bucks. Mm-hmm. You walk out the store, it's worth maybe 260. You put it on your foot, it's worth 90. Oh shit. And I mean, that's a pretty trimmed down version of how it works, but yeah. So that's why selling shoes is a huge industry. Kids are making, there's literally kids making millions, Mm -hmm. if not six figures, if not millions on some of this, because that's just on the shoes that we get in a small prairie city. You're Mm -hmm. going to a major metropolitan and you're getting the latest releases. Some of those are 10 grand. They bought them for 180, they're 10 grand the second they walk out that store. Holy shit. And that's not ever anything I've ever, I've never been, I've never spent more than maybe three fifty on a pair. Yeah. That's pretty typical for yeah. like a decent pair of shoes. I spent $500 on dress shoes yeah. once. Won't do it again, but I did it once. Yeah. I'll spend $400 on jeans, but again, that was about it. <laughs> yeah. Shoes are my only real indulgence in that way, Damn. but I've, I've cut off on it. Like I, there was a point I was probably getting three or four a month. Now I'm getting maybe three or four a year. Are you going to stop at like 300 or do you want to like just kind of continue on yeah, and see what happens? It's one of those, it's like, it's like, let's say it's exercise. You want to be able to run 10 K and then you yeah. get to 10 K. Well, now I got to do 15. So yeah, my goal mm-hmm. was to get a hundred and then I eclipsed that. And then 250 was always a number I had in my head and like 250, like it seems like nothing. Yeah. It seems like a ton to you, but I've had these 250 for years, so it seems like I have zero pairs of shoes. So now I'm like 365 is always a cool number to have. Oh, yeah. In your head. I and hear. Because then, then you I, can wear one every day yeah, of the that, year kind of thing. And then you can say, yeah, I have a pair for every day. That's great. Yeah, that's cool. 
but I, I don't, I don't think I'll get there. Eh. Too many other things in life. Well, and you know, with the little the one baby. coming, and I'm not going to buy the baby sneakers. Yeah, screw that kid. Everyone, <laughs> no, like, yeah, earn your own shoes, you dumb jerk. Go no, to it's, work. Yeah, get a okay, job. Buy your take shoes. A briefcase and come back, and you can buy some. No, it's because I only started collecting shoes when my feet stopped growing. Fair. I was very into shoes, but well, a I was a kid, but it's stupid. Buying something that you can't use is stupid unless it's a decor- decoration or whatever. But even then, that's it's serving a purpose. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'll maybe get him one neat pair because he's got to have something. But it's I'm not gonna he's not gonna be decked out in cool shoes all the time. It's just stupid. Ex- buying shoes in general is a waste of money, but it's an extra waste of money when they're hot garbage in a month and a half. Well, and more importantly. When the kid's stepping out and when you're stepping out, the kid needs somebody to aspire to. Yeah, I need I so need to address that little boy. When when you're walking out with those sneakers and they're looking, it's like, oh, I really want to look like that. And then you could turn around and be like, get a job. <laughs> That'll be a life lesson. I might get him some matching shoes, though, just because I'm, uh, I'm super okay being corny like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. I've come like to the, the point where I'm okay with that. The outfit's different, but the shoes are the same? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't... We can go full outfit, too, but I, I'll probably get him some sort of matching shoes, I'd imagine. Hmm. But Sweet, man. He's not going to have a collection <laughs> until he's done growing. He's not even going to get near 200 unless he no. pays for it himself. But I will, I will make sure, like, if he's getting... His one pair for the year, his two pairs for the year. Yep. I'll make sure he gets something at least a little bit cool. Yeah. Because yeah. there, there is certain, like, because I've sold shoes for quite some time, and parents just want to get their kids the cheapest shit because mm-hmm. they grow out of it. Fair. I get it. You're, But at the same time, buckle up. Spend 27 extra bucks and get them a pair of shoes that's not going to break their feet for the rest of their lives. Yeah, like even just one one thing a year that they may grow out of, but it's like a special thing that they'll have yeah. for like at least, I don't know, a month Yeah, it's or a week or whatever. Whether it's quality or style or something, when, when parents skimp out on that because their kids are growing, I it it irks me in, in a wrong way. And especially if they have, the parents themselves have expensive stuff on. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. and that, that's typically the case. Like oh, we just we can't. Your limits this dollar amount. And they're dressing four hundred dollars worth of clothing and stuff. One could argue that's how they're able to dress their four hundred. Well, exactly. <laughs> and then yeah, so you're taking away from the they're, kid. They're walking around in Walmart brand shoes, which are have nothing to them. And then you're walking around in whatever you want. Again, you earn the money. You can spend it how you want. But mm. it. I just think that the thought press on it is backwards. Yeah. They're thinking about it in the wrong way. Fair enough. Well, my man, we did uh, two hours and 27 minutes. Holy. F- that's a lot. Did it fly by? After the first seven minutes, it flew by. Because <laughs> the first seven minutes, like, oh, there's a microphone well, in my face. Happen. I wanted to see how long it would take me to realize that there wasn't a microphone in my face. Oh, yeah. I hear you. Although I think I'm like two feet back from it anyways. You might be, but we'll see how it is. You're going to have to crank up the volume on yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, it's cool. Dude, and thank you for coming by. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Yeah, man. Um, any final things you want to say? No, just uh, get ready, Anthony and Vass, because I'm taking over. <laughs> We're taking over. That's an Akon reference, and I'm not a big Akon <laughs> fan Nobody either. Got it. Uh, yeah, um, this was. Uh, I don't even know what kind of deep dive this was. I think it was um, friendship deep dive. Yeah, it is deep dive friendship. That's what it's going to be. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at the F words G. You can email us at the F word podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you're following, uh, the F word podcast on Instagram and the lazy Canadian on Instagram and wherever you're listening from, whether it's Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Cast, YouTube, or all those places, if you are so inclined to leave a review or a like or anything like that, it is very, very much appreciated. Is there anything you want to plug Robert? No, if you want to look at my shoes, you can go to the Burt Bailey on Instagram at the Burt Bailey. Serious? You'll oh. see a few. Few. I used to take pictures. That was my thing. Okay. I was a, I was a geek for that, but I've never good at it. But you have can you, see all of you them haven't done way. it for a while, then, because I think I have you on Instagram. Yeah, I haven't posted in a year, probably. Oh, okay, that probably makes more. sense. Because I was like, I think I know that account. How but come if, I haven't seen? If any you want to go into the backlog of what I've had, then S- do that. So it's the B E R T B A I L E Y. Yeah, I'm not plugging it. If, I'm it's, plugging but it. it's the only it's literally the only social media thing I have. Hey Amen. That's fair enough. Um that was it. This is a deep dive on uh friendship. I'm G. That was Robert and we're out. Yeah.